Carolyn. Hello, I'm Carolyn Knight, um, the Executive Director of the Developmental Disabilities Council for Ohio. Uh, and I just want to um, welcome you all today. And, I, and that's my favorite picture of me. I don't look, my hair is different now, but I'm so glad you gave me that picture, Paul, as opposed to um, some of the others. Um, it's, it's great um, to welcome you all today. You know, um, we were just talking about some of, the, some of the grants the council has funded over the years that have just turned out to be so successful. And so hopefully some of you here today are gonna apply for grants that um, wind up being just as successful. And one of the things I, I wanna say is Council regards these grants as experiments. So we're, we're doing new and different things. And so there's no, no necessary formula for success. And if it doesn't turn out the way you think, that's not uh, a problem, that's new information. And that's what we're all about. So um, never, never be um, um, nervous about taking on something and, and thinking, well, what if this doesn't work out or whatever? Because that's what we're all about. We're all about figuring out what will work in the state for people with, with disabilities in their families and what won't and why it won't. And oftentimes um, when there is a problem, when a grantee turns out uh, with a grant and says, gee, this, this just didn't work the way I thought. We, we send that out to the whole country because you, you will discover things that no one else ever knew. So um, we welcome you here today, um, go forward, uh, and, and hopefully this will give you the tools you need to apply for these grants and do something uh, wonderful so that we can be sitting here in another five years talking about something that you all have done. Thank you so much. Hello, and uh, Carolyn is already welcome to our bidders conference. My name is Patika Diana Ayers, and I am the planner for council. I'm the one kind of coordinates uh, the staff working with my colleagues to put this day together so that you all can understand more about council and understand the process. The overview for the day is I will then uh, begin to talk to you about what the council is. For those of you that are very new to council, don't know who we are, hopefully I will give you some insight into the organization that you are applying to. I'm also going to take you into the DD council application process so that you'll understand what is required. My colleague, Paul Jarvis, is going to explain to you how to use our application. Our, it's called the DD Suites. He's going to take you step by step on how to get an account, et cetera. My other colleague, Gary Groom, is gonna to talk to you about the fiscal and the budget requirements so that you'll get that part right because that part is kind of the more complicated part of the application. And then my other colleague, Ken Latham, is gonna to talk to you about understanding the un and underserved section of the application of what council is looking for in that area. And then my other wonderful colleague, uh, Leslie Conley, Conley, who is like the condesser of clear language, is going to explain to you what that means. And you're gonna notice in my, uh, uh, in my, um, my presentation, a lot of clear language is used. It makes it very simple and understanding so that you can get it real quickly. And then in the afternoon, we'll take a quick little break. In the afternoon, you'll get to meet with each staff person under the areas in which you are looking forward to apply a grant. Hopefully, to ask them some questions, to hear what you need to do, and then you're good to go. We're going to go on with the overview of council, and here is slide number one. Council was created in 1963 and authorized by the federal law called the Developmental Disabilities and Bill of Rights. There is a council in every state and the Ohio Developmental Disability is one of a network of councils committed to self-determination, community inclusion for people with, dis with developmental disabilities. 
Now, the DD Council, we receive funding for advocacy, which is speaking out for people with developmental disabilities and their families, helping them to speak out for themselves, capacity building, which is increasing. The, I can't hardly see it because of the pictures. Increasing the access to services that people with disabilities need, and then systems change. The way in which we deliver our services so that people with developmental disabilities have their independence, participation in their communities with policymakers, and to change the laws when necessary. Because the mission of the DD Council is to create change that improves independence productivity and inclusion for people with disabilities and their families and community life. Next slide, Paul. Thank you. The Ohio Developmental Disabilities Council consists of at least 30 members that are appointed by council. You, they are people with developmental disabilities, parents, guardians of, the, of people with disabilities, represented from concerned state agencies, nonprofit organizations, local agencies providing services uh, for people with developmental disabilities. So that's who the council is. How do we carry out our mission? Well, we do this by developing a system that whereby conducts advocacy and systems change through our projects. Uh, we, we have several areas of federal uh, emphasis. As you can see, it's education, early intervention, quality assurance, child care, health, employment, housing, transportation, recreation, and other services available or offered to individuals in a community. Thank you, Paul. Next slide. Now, the council has a five-year plan. This five-year plan is the big picture of how services uh, and supports for individuals with developmental disabilities and their family are currently and what we feel they should be in the next five years. It also provides us with gout guidance on how we should spend our resources. So you'll see every project has their amount of funding. It identifies barriers to be overcome or that needs to be changed and includes long-term goals to be accomplished in five years. And it also includes outcomes that we have to report to, to the administration on intellectual and developmental disabilities. In developing our outcomes every five years by law, what we do is a long process, but to make it short, we gather information from people with disabilities, their family members, service providers, public agencies, and other organizations to determine, to help, so they can help us determine what council needs to focus in on the next five years. Then council members with the help from staff, we take a look at all of these and we develop outcomes. Then staff recommends to the council um, key activities that we think could be involved to accomplish this. Now we worked on this from 2019 to now we are 2021. And this plan is actually due to our funding source on August of uh, August of 15, 2021. After we do the five-year state plan, each year the council develops a, a state plan, annual work plan that outlines what we will work on towards our five years. And we get to update them because as the political environment changes and things change around us, what we put in the plan initially may not fit for how the environment changes. So the federal government gives us the flexibility to work with our grantees to tweak some things as we go along in order to fit the, uh, the, the environment that we're going in. And then the council would like to make these goals our objectives, the meeting of a goal in our five-year plan. And that's due on August the 15th of that year as well. Otherwise, if we don't put changes in, it's not due until December. Just a little tidbit you might wanna know. Next slide. Council currently has about 22 projects or 25 projects that support ideas in the state plan designed to promote system change. We already have grant review panels 
award, uh, the grant review panels award the projects to successful applicants who have submitted their proposal. Each year, the executive committee reviews the continuation proposal to determine if they should be continue on or not. A complete list of the projects that are that we are currently that are currently being funded and operated right now can be found on council's website. We currently, right now, that we're getting ready to do for the next five-year plan, we have 22 new grants and one continuation grant. Most of our grants are for five years. Each funding is for each year, and it depends upon the availability of funding, hopefully council keeps our funding, and then the successful completion of the previous year's activity. Right now, all your application must be submitted on the DD suites that Paul will be talking to you about by 11.59 p.m. on Friday, uh, July the 2nd, 2020. No application will be accepted after that time. And applications will not be considered if it's not complete. So you must fill out each section of the application. And the grant review panels will be meeting on August 5th and 6th to select the application that best, best fits what we had in mind. Now let's talk about how the applications are screened. Any determination made to eliminate an application from further consideration as a result of the screening process will be made by the executive director. Staff will put the facts together as we know it and we will give it to her and she will make the determination. Um, then a written notification will be sent to you with the executive director's signature, and we'll get that to you, that email to you no later, hopefully than August the 14th, so that you won't be sitting around waiting for something that's not gonna happen. The next steps in the process, we will send you a notification by September 14th, a call, a letter, or email with all decisions made by the grant review panel for, that will be final. And that's to the, all those people who have been uh, 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 awarded the grant or preliminarily awarded the grant. Next slide, Paul. Now, if you have been awarded the grant before you get that letter saying you've been awarded, you will get a conditions letter with suggestions and conditions that must be met in order to receive the grant. And each staff person will give you the due date that that response has to be in. And it's gotta be done rather quickly because your grant is supposed to start on October the 1st, 2021, okay? Now let's look at the parts of the application that Paul is gonna be going over. When you, when you go on the DD suite, you're gonna see a project outline. It's gonna include the executive summary, your qualifications for even applying for this. Why do you think you, know, you have the skills or the know-how to do the project? It, there has to be a detailed narrative. That's like the biggest part of the application where you can go step by step on how you plan to implement your project. Then there's a section on outreach to the un and underserved. You got to answer each one of those questions as thoroughly as you can. You need to think about who are you going to target? Is it an ethnicity? Is it the urban? Is it rural? Whatever. You have to really look at that and determine who you're going to talk who you're gonna target and then explain. Then there's a section about inclusion. How are you gonna include people with developmental disabilities and, your, and their families in your project in paid or unpaid roles? Because we, again, we like to include people with disabilities in everything we do in their families. Then there's a work plan you have to fill out. And then there's a budget and a budget justification. Right to the project description that you will get because the plan language explains what you're writing to, okay? Then you must have some supporting documents and there's a tab that allows you to provide additional notes and to, to um, 
also provide these following documents to your application. You got to sign the insurances because this is a competitive grant. You have to have three letters of recommendations. So it just can't be Mary Lou who just feels like, well, I think I can do it. And there's nobody that can recommend and say, yeah, I know she could do it and blah, blah, blah. Because one of the things I, I want to share that's not in the slide is what makes your application powerful that our funding source pushes us to inform you is that there needs to be collaboration among just you. You need to figure out ways you can leverage dollars. That means how can I get other people's dollars or how can I use in kind or other people's just human thoughts or their, their knowledge to help me with this project. And then you need to think about how would you sustain the project after the five years is over? So in your narrative, you need to include those three things. It's not on the slide, but it's a very critical piece of your application. Collaboration, leveraging of dollars, and how you might sustain your, your project. You need to include the resume of your project director, and then the names and address of your board members, if that's applicable, and proof of your nonprofit status, if that's uh, uh, applicable. Users can attach each one of these documents separately. All right, next slide, Paul. The DD suite, what I love about the DD suite, it will not allow a project to be, application be dis, uh, uh, submitted without the minimum of the following, the name of the project director, the finance officer, and the organization director in those tasks. And you must answer all the questions in the outline, all the outline questions, you, and there's a tab for it, you must answer all of them, and you need to include one objective and at least one activity uh, that you're doing under the object objective and activity and performance tabs, okay? And there's tabs for all of these. You're gonna find when you see the plan language, it has a goal, it has an objective, objective and the impact of the project that we hope to get. You're also gonna see the background, the rationale, and scope why we decide to do this. And what we hope to gain from doing this is very thorough. You're going to see key activities. This is what's, and, but you may have other activities, but the staff has included a starting point for you. You're going to see outputs that we require. You're going to see short-term outcome and long-term outcomes. And then you'll also see the funding level of your project and you have to work within those parameters. Next slide, Paul. Now there is a policy that we have that if you're if you're seeking more than one of our grants, council does encourage the funds to be spread out among a broad base of people and not just one entity. However, entities that have more than one grant, it has to be exceed uh, if it exceeds a hundred thousand dollars we will then have to take it to full council to get approval by a third, a three-fourths of a vote. So you may be delayed in, in getting your response. Also, you will find if you look at that policy, if you are applying for an additional grant, you need to say that in your qualifications or somewhere in the proposal, there's a place where you could put, well, I am applying for such and such grant as well. So that is noted and we can stay on the lookout for that. Okay. And then we're going to turn off to Paul Jarvis and he's going to tell you everything you wanted to know and didn't want to know about the DD Suites. All right, thank you, Fatika. You got done a few few minutes early. Is it okay for me to go before 1030? Yes, you can. Okay, okay. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to um, pop out of the PowerPoint, because I want to walk you guys through the, the actual DD suite. Um, for some of you who have had a grant with us before, this might be a little bit repetitive, um, or you might learn something new that you weren't aware of. Um, so what I'm going to do, um, let me get prepped here. 
The other thing that I wanted to share with everybody is, um, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, is on our website, uh, we actually have a, a state plan proposal kit that has a lot of the information that we're covering today. Um, but we found that, you know, you, you can put as much written information out as, as you want. Um, it's still helpful to walk uh, folks through it. Um, but on this, uh, the state plan proposal kit, um, it can be found on our website under grantee orientation and resources. It's this uh, tab here. Um, so you can click on that. And then within that, um, there are links within that, the, you know, different, different sections of the proposal kit. There's a link for DD Suite instructions that will um, take you through how to create an account, how to join an existing organization, et cetera, et cetera, which I'm going to walk you through here today. Okay. So we do, as Fatika mentioned, we use the DD Suite, which is a a browser-based grant application program, um, and you do need to have a, an account, okay? And the generally, the only thing you need to create an account is an email address, okay? So I'm gonna walk you through uh, creating an account here. Can every, Everyone can see my screen, I hope. Um, so I'm gonna sign up up in the upper right-hand corner. I've gone to ddsuite.org, and I'm just gonna click uh, sign up here. Um, you can see that I've created a couple accounts, uh, but I'm going to create a new account so that you guys can see uh, what we're doing here. I've created a few different fake emails. So you got to enter the email twice and it's got a match. Um, and we'll just say this is Tony Wonder. He's a magician. Um, and so you will see that if you can see on my screen here, Fatika mentioned it was hard to see. You should be able to adjust the viewable screen. You can make the cameras much smaller um, or you can minimize the cameras um, but uh, so, so that you can see. But uh, you have some fields here. The email is required. There's a little asterisk here that shows you what is required. So phone, address, city is required. So I'm in Columbus. And I'm going to pick Ohio um, in my zip, zip code here. Okay, so um, we're going to create a new password. Uh, um, it asks you if you want to create some security questions. I am not. It's very quickly, it's very easy to reset your password within uh, DD Suite. And then there is a form validation. The, the DD Suite used to, when you were creating an account, it used to send you a link, uh, a hyperlink to the email address that you were using. It doesn't do that anymore. So that's a, that's a plus. All you really need to do is answer this form validation question. So um, how much is one plus one? Spell the answer. So hopefully I'm doing this right and I can save. Oh, see, could not review your account, there's an error below, okay? So you can see that my uh, email account did not match. So we're just gonna fix that. Tony Wonder 865 at Gmail. Um, and then I have an invalid password. So you can see on the right here, there are some password requirements. So I need an uppercase, lowercase number and a similar character, no spaces. So let's try a different password. Okay, and if you want to, you can click this link and it'll show your password. I'm not going to show you because I use that password uh, for quite a few things. And then I have to re-answer the question. So what is Justin Timberlake's first name? Hopefully I've done this right this time. Okay, my account has been created. Um, let, me, let me save this. Okay, um, so I'm going to hit close and now I'm going to log in. Okay. So um, here we are, we're at the, my account, okay? Now that's the first part of creating an account in DD Suite. So every individual that you have, that, you, that you're gonna have working on your um, grant application, you are going to want to, let me, uh, 
you, you are going to want to have them uh, associated with an organization, right? So an individual cannot apply for an account. You apply for the, or you can't apply for a grant. You apply for the grant via an organization, okay? So um, it says here, you are not associated with any organizations because I've just created this account. Um, uh, you can join an existing organization or you can create your own. If you haven't applied for, or you know your organization hasn't applied for a grant before with DD Council, you can click this little create button and it'll take you through uh, sort of a similar field. Uh, what's the name of your organization? Do you have a DUNS number? I'll walk you through a little bit of that here, but I'm gonna join. I'm gonna see if um, the organization that I want to join is listed here. So um, there is a drop down here for the state that I'm looking for. Uh, Massachusetts is going to pop up because they they created the DD suite, so that's the default. Um, so I'm going to click Ohio. Um, I can click the type of the types, but I'm going to apply filter. So I can click Ohio, nothing will change on my screen here until I click apply filter. Okay, so now I can see all the different organizations that have created an account in um, in DD suite. And for my dummy account, I have the Bluth Family Banana Stand. Um, so I'm going to join them. Are you sure you want to join the Bluth Family Banana Stand? Yes. Okay. So. Okay. So it's not as simple as just joining the organization. Someone at that organization, because it already exists, has to approve me as a user. Okay. That would prevent, say, anybody from joining your organization, getting into your grant applications and seeing what you're applying for. The, the, the organization will have a couple of levels of um, uh, uh, permissions or permission levels. So you can see here, there are administrators within the organization. Uh, there's George Bluth, Jean Parmesan, Paul Schumach. Um, th these are all people that have to approve me as a user within the organization of the Bluth Family Banana Stand. Okay, um, so I'm not automatically in. Okay, so to do that, what I'm going to do, I, you're going to see what uh, what a current um, what a current organization would do is I'm going to I'm going to log into Bluth. Okay, and so this is a, what a normal dashboard looks like, and I'll show you all what that generally here, uh, what all this stuff is. But you'll see over here, I have a notification tab. And within that notification tab, I have a join request. So somebody's asked to join my organization. You can see also I have an application that modifications have been requested. That's sort of associated with the conditions that Pika talked about. Now I'll, I'll delve into that when we get to the application process. But we're going to review the join request. Um, so I have a, 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 this pending here. Um, you see that it's Tony Wonder. Um, he's a magician. So I'm going to click on his name and uh, I can give him, I can make him a grantee administrator or a grantee staff. So a grantee administrator is somebody who has full authority, they can see all the grants, um, they can do anything within that organization's DD Suite account. A grantee staff person is only going to have access to the grants and the information that they're assigned. Okay, um, so if you have a large organization, you have multiple people within your organization, maybe working on multiple different grants, um, you might not want the staff uh, muddling about in another a different grant for your organization. So we're going to make Tony Wonder grantee staff, and I'm going to use this drop down and authorize them as a user. Um, if you get an application from someone, a join request from somebody that you don't know, um, you can deny them and they won't, they'll get a note saying you've been denied. All right, so I'm going to save that. You can see, you can see here, we can update people's phone numbers here. Um, and since I am uh, within the DD suite here, so I've used, I've approved, let's see here now, he is grantee staff, Tony Wonder, authorized, okay? The administrator can also see their last login and then you can edit people's information as needed. If you wanted to add a number in here, you could do that. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the dashboard. So what you're seeing here is a dashboard for a grantee administrator, okay? 
So um, if you're grantee staff, the dashboard's gonna look the same, except that you're only gonna get notifications for, for projects that you've been uh, connected to. And you're not gonna have this module called administration. So these are our modules. Um, you can see that if your organization has um, had applications in the past, so I'm clicking on the applications here, um, we see that they've started a application. It's in progress for the General Assembly briefing sessions. Um, they started an application for um, assisting, assessing assistive technology. Um, and then they, they applied for and were denied a grant for um, in 2017. And um, they applied for a Columbus NOFA training and they, um, they were approved with modifications and they have to complete the modifications in order to um, receive the grant. Okay, I'm gonna go back up in the upper right hand corner. I'm just gonna go back to my dashboard. Um, this is your projects tab. So anything that's been approved will appear here, but um, this, because it's a dummy account, it doesn't really have any approved grants, but that's the application is, the, is what you sent. The project is what's approved, the final thing. So that's what you're working on. Um, there's a periodic reporting tab here uh, for those of you who apply and receive a grant. This is where you'll be able to submit your program and expense reports um, when they come due. Additionally, um, in your notifications tab, if you're tied to a project that has an upcoming ex program or expense report, um, a reminder will pop up. Hey, your report's due. Click here to complete it. Um, so there'll be like a little link here. All right. Um, then there's a NOFA and RFP uh, tab. I'm just going to click on that. So I've clicked on the NOFA and RFP tab, and you'll see now um, all of the projects that are listed by every state. Okay. Um, so we actually have uh, currently in this five year plan, we have an applicant from another state. So they opened up their DD suite. They saw, look, oh, Ohio's offering this grant. I'm going to apply. They, they won the competitive review, and now they're one of our applicants. So um, let me make sure that I've covered everything. Gone through the dashboard, the permissions, account administrator. Um, before I move on, I, before I get into the application process, does anybody have any questions related to creating account, permission levels? Um, oh, there, there is one other thing I wanted to show you. Um, so uh, uh, let me administration. So uh, if if you have created an account and you haven't you haven't obtained your DUNS number, right? So within uh, part of the things of having an application with council or having a grant with council is going through the the SAM registration and obtaining a DUNS number. So it's possible for you to apply without having that number, but at some point you're going to have to come back. We're going to want you to come back and put that into the DD suite so that we have it. So to do that, you, you'll see that I went to, um, I went to the, the grantee administrator would go on administration. And then you can see here that there's a bunch of information here um, and there's a DUNS number here. So that would be blank. I would hit edit here. Or if you've moved, let's say you're, you, you move down the street, you can update your address, you got a new phone number, um, but you can update your DUNS number. And then I hit save. And now my uh, DUNS number is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, so at, at this point, are there any questions related to uh, creating an account uh, or account administration? All right, hearing none and seeing none, unless you were asking your question muted, uh, I'm going to move on to the application process. Let's see. Um, I believe uh, what. Well, I'll check, maybe Gary can answer this question because uh, there was a question in chat, is DUNS for profit only? I don't believe so. I think everyone needs to obtain a, a uh, Dun Bradstreet number. Is that correct, Gary? Are you on? I, I am on. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Okay, uh, yes, a, a Dun and Bradstreet number 
um, is required uh, for all applicants. Uh, there is an exception um, that's written into the federal rule uh, for individuals. Um, well, basically for individuals who, who are doing, I'm sorry. <laughs> But what we threw we threw a yes, it's required. And it there is, is required, an exception. Yes. And we'll give you time to look that up and I'll just keep moving on to the thanks, Paul. To, to the application. Okay, so um what I'm gonna do is I am going to run through an application or, or submit an application. Um none of the information that I put in here is gonna be pertinent to the actual grant application that, that we're working on here but uh, you'll get to see what the process looks like, okay? So I'm logged in as a grantee administrator. I'm, I'm logged in as Gene Parmesan. Um, he's a private investigator and he's decided that he is going to um, apply for, I'm gonna use one of my grants. Uh, none of the other staff get a notice here. Um, I'm gonna click, what's this DD Awareness and Advocacy Day? So um, I click on that and I get some uh, very pertinent information here. So. Uh, the applications due July 2nd. Um, it's, it starts October 1st and ends September 30th. These are one-year cycles. Obviously, if you're awarded, you'll you'll be able to continue this four more times. So you'll have uh, the, this grant for five years. Um, but this is the funding for the first year, the one-year funding. Um, and then there's a match requirement. And uh, I'm sure during the fiscal part of this and in our booklet that I showed you, there's a very good explanation of what matches and how to how to provide that. And it tells you the council staff responsible is. It provides you a description. Um, it, it includes the requirements. So Patika mentioned there's a supporting documents tab. So you'll need like three letters of recommendation, the resume. I'll show you where you can add that here to your application. Um, and then there are some attachments, okay? So the attachments are uh, the plan language, um, so there's the state plan language. There are the assurances, which must be downloaded, printed off, signed, and then attached back to your application. Um, all applications must include a copy of your signed assurances. Um, and then that booklet that I talked about that I showed you at the very beginning, um, that's actually attached to every notice of funds available that we have. So you can download that and go, okay, I'm just gonna follow the instructions um, if I have a question about the what you know budget justification, if I have a question about uh, when are the program or expense reports due, all of that is in the master plan booklet. It's fascinating reading. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to apply for this grant. So there's a button here, apply for this grant. I'm going to click on it. Okay, so um, it's it's now going to start a unique application for the Bluth Family Banana Stand. Um, for the DD Awareness and Advocacy Day, okay? Um, so I can change the title if I want. Um, I could say, um, I could say, say Bananas Rule. I could do whatever I want. It's probably a good idea to keep, keep some, if you wanna change the title, there's nothing stopping you from doing it. Um, it would be helpful for the staff to have it somehow connect to the project that you're applying for. Um, and then we ask you to write in your own words, the goal of your project, right? So within our, within our uh, state plan language, we have a goal. A lot of applicants just copy that goal, right? They write what that goal is, you know, to um, hold a uh, awareness day at the state house, okay? So we ask you, uh, we don't require, but we ask you to provide an area of emphasis. So there is a drop down here. Um, and so I'm just gonna put uh, cross cutting, okay? Because we're educating policymakers, we're educating self-advocates, we're doing a number of different things um, that would generally qualify for cross cutting. And then um, within our booklet, there is a list of entities that uh, are, are counties in the state of Ohio. So if you're within a poverty county, um, you can, you would be eligible for what's called poverty match, um, which is a lower match requirement, but uh, generally there's only two counties out of the 88 that are currently uh, considered the poverty county. So I'm gonna keep this at non-poverty. 
uh, we there's some more drop downs here. Primary activity type. So um, for the DD day, it is uh, it's a day for people to meet with their legislators. So um, there's a there's it could be training, it could be supporting and educating communities, um, it could be barrier elimination system design and redesign, coalition development, citizen participation. I'm going to put informing policymakers. We meet with legislators. So um, if there's other activity types that you want to include, if it's more than one of these, um, I could put training because we we teach people what to how to talk to their legislator. Uh, and then if you have a collaborator, so what we have here is the state PNA in the University Centers of Excellence. Um, in Ohio, we have two, the Nysonger Center and Cincinnati Children's. We really do want to know if you're applying for a grant and you plan to collaborate with either of those entities, um, we want you to indicate that on your um, application. And if not, um, if you have another uh, collaborator, say uh, State Department of DD, has agreed to uh, sort of work with uh, work on the project with you. Um, by all means, list your other collaborators. I think that's helpful for the the grant review panel when they're looking at you know what's the size and scope of the project that you're uh, that you're planning. Okay. So so far, uh, nothing's still in the DD suite. I've all I've done is entered stuff in fields. Um, once I hit save here, all it will do is create sort of an application template for me. Okay. So data is saved. I got a little note saying everything is good. Um, had I missed an important thing, you would have seen a, a pop-up saying you've missed something and it'll appear in red. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so here we have um, the applications and uh, the, it's, I've changed the name to the bananas rule. Um, and then we have some tabs here. We have summary, setup, people, outline, budget, work plan, support docs, and guidelines. The, these tabs are very important to completing your application process, okay? So the summary here um, is going to be everything. It's going to be the entire application. Um, so uh, we have the applicant information. We have the title. We have the goal. Um, but we don't have anything else because I haven't assigned people to this grant. I haven't answered any of the outline questions, and I haven't created a budget. I haven't created a work plan and I haven't um, uploaded any documents. So um, this is a, the summary tab is really a good way to look at, okay, the entire application, what parts are complete, what parts are uh, still need worked on um, so that you can complete your grant. Okay, so uh, the other important, really great thing about DD Suite is I've created this application, okay? And now I don't have to sit here for hours on end and complete it. I can work on a tab, I can do uh, certain things and save it and come back to it later. To do that, I'm just gonna click on my dashboard. I'm gonna pop out of this, okay? So um, let's say that something comes up, I have a meeting, I, I shut down DD Suite, I've saved my information, I shut it down, and then I come back the next day and I wanna find that application. I would come to the application tab. Um, I'm gonna click on my application bananas rule and I'm smack dab right where in, in, on the summary. Okay, so um, let's say I don't like uh, bananas rule. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna fix it back to, you'll see that the D suite is very flexible in letting you do what you wanna do. Uh, I've, I fixed the, fixed the name of it. Um, and now I'm gonna go through each of the tabs and show you what, um, what that, what that exists, uh, what, what that, I can't even think of the word, what it looks like. So here we have uh, the people tab, as Fatika mentioned, um, and it's listed right here. Applications require three key roles, okay? And it says that the same individual can be assigned to all three roles. Okay? If you're a small organization, you're a single person nonprofit, you can be all three of those. You can be the director, the project director, and the financial officer. So um, I'm going to add organization personnel here. So I click on that link and I need to select a role. So I need a project director, a financial officer, and a director. So let's click the director. Um, and then within this person, this dropdown, are going to be all of the people that have created a DD Suite account um, and then were approved as a user within that organization. 
So if say you have somebody within your organization that you want to add to this project, they're not going to appear in this dropdown until they've created an account within DD Suite. So they've asked to join your organization until a grantee administrator has approved them as a user. Okay. And it's possible even after the grant has been uh, approved to, uh, to add people in, remove people. Uh, we understand that you know, pe people take different jobs, they move along, um, you have uh, new hires. Uh, that's, it's possible to do that, uh, is to adjust and edit who the project personnel are. Okay, so um, we're gonna assign a person so then for the organization director, if you're in a large organization and the director's like, I don't, I don't need the, the emails from the DD suite, right? You have um, a, a division within your organization that is applying for and doing the grant and the director doesn't need to, to know when the program report is due or when a budget report is due or, or that a budget report has been, uh, expense report has been approved. Um, but if they do, you can say yes. You know, I want to want them to receive emails. So you can um, uh, set up the email preferences for each user any way uh, that you prefer. Okay. So now I've saved that user. I still have two more people to add because I have the project director and the financial officer. So I'm going to quickly just add people here. I'm going to add uh, Tony Wonder and. Uh, the financial officer, I'll add Gary, since he's our financial officer. So you'll notice when I add financial officer, it automatically says Gary will receive emails. If I change it to project directors uh, or to, uh, you know, organization director, it, the default is no emails. Um, so you want to look at, okay, what are, what, what is the default email preference for that individual? Okay, so now I have my three people. Um, you're welcome to add more. If you have uh, multiple project staff working on your project, by all means, give them access to DD Suite or to the project within DD Suite. Um, but you at, at least need those three. Okay. Um, so the next part is the outline. Uh, we call this the heart of the proposal. Um, and you'll see here that there are a series of outline questions, okay? So uh, the executive summary, the qualifications, the narrative, which is the heart of the proposal, the outreach section, um, you know, which they, they provide you with a series of sub questions that it's uh, very wise to try and answer each subsection of uh, sub question, um, inclusion and the budget justification. And I, I will quickly show you budget justification, but I think Gary uh, plans to show you a little bit more um, when he talks on the, uh, fiscal parts. So very quickly, uh, to answer a question, um, we're going to hit edit. Okay. So uh, this is the executive summary. And then note that we, um, you know, the council will receive multiple grants in, in order to sort of contain our grants within a um, readable and understandable uh, application. Uh, when you have multiple grant applications, they you know, they try to limit the size of the application. So for the executive summary, 2,500 characters or less, um, you know, for a one paragraph abstract, that's more than enough. 2,500 characters is generally a full page of text. Uh, so that should be sufficient. But um, as I click in here and start typing, you'll notice that in the upper right hand corner, I actually have a counter, 33 of 2,500. So you can keep working on on your thing and know that um, how, how close or far you are from your uh, character limit, okay? So once I've an answered a, um, that portion, I'm gonna hit save. And now you're gonna see in the response, the actual uh, text that we've provided here. So the next part is the qualifications. So uh, describe your organization's qualifications to implement a proposed project. So we've limited this to 5,000 characters, which is roughly two pages. So, you know, you could say Tony Wonder, a magician uh, with, with years of experience dazzling audiences. Gene Parmesan, et cetera, 
Okay, um, just got the counter. Uh, so this is where you're going to uh, identify the uh, qualifications of your organization, the qualifications of the people that uh, work in your organizations, the description of your mission and philosophy, um, and uh, include any experience that you have providing culturally competent services and supports to individuals with DD and their family. All right, so the narrative, uh, this is the biggest section. So we're actually 25,000 characters, which is roughly 10 pages of text. Uh, this is for these applications, I believe we ask folks to write um, not just to the first year of your project, okay? So uh, presuming that you are applying for a grant and it spans five years, um, there, I think what we're looking for is for a detailed narrative of what is your plan, you know, not only in year one, but over the span, the five-year span of this, um, of, of this grant application. We have, I think, in our in our uh, plan language, short-term and long-term goals. Um, so you should be sort of addressing those uh, those goals in your narrative section. Um, so you can, you know, you can write a, write as much or as little as you want, um, and uh, that will be graded. I think this this. The response to this question in terms of the, the score that a grant review panel could give your application, um, the, the score here is the highest possible score uh, for a single response than all of the other responses. I think it's worth 45 out of your 100, and, 100 or 110 points. So this is the biggest chunk. So you wanna take some uh, time and care in um, responding to this. So I'm gonna quickly see, you can see, and then um, say I've changed my mind, I, I can go back and fix this before I submit it, right? Okay, let me just very quickly fill these in. You know, I can I can submit this this application with one word answers. Not a good idea, but I can do it. Um, everybody gets to see my typing under duress. There we go. Uh, okay, I think that is all of the all of the questions have been answered or have a response in them. So the DD suite will now allow me, it won't with, you know, hold up my application because of a missing response there. If there is a question that does not have a response, when you go to submit later, um, it'll say, I'm sorry, you're, this, this section is blank. You have to go back and um, fill it in. It won't let you submit an incomplete application. Uh, it will, however, let you submit an application without a budget, right? So you're welcome to submit a, a grant application to council and they might approve it uh, and not pay you because you didn't ask for any money. Um, but your, your budget is, it, it is uh, the most flexible thing that uh, you have within the DD suite. For example, if you have a project that's within the plan language that says uh, the grant award is for $35,000 of federal funds, um, and I think that's the case in here. You can write a budget for $100,000 of federal funds and submit it. The DD suite is not going to stop you from doing that. Um, but the grant review panel might say, well, we're, we, we don't have that money. There's, a, there, you know, we've a budgeted $35,000 for that. Um, you're able to submit a budget for $10,000 of council funds. Um, so your budget is not, that's not going to hold you up from submitting your application in terms of, I have an amount that does not equal what the plan language says um, and what the DD suite says is available. Okay, so within this budget, so I have, I've completed people, I've completed outline. Um, now I'm gonna quickly do budget. I'll show you, we have eight budget categories. Um, within that category, you can add multiple line items within a category. So I'm just gonna go personnel without fringe benefits. 
Um, nature of expense, we'll say Jean Parmesan needs to be paid. And then there's a tab here for justification. Do not fill that out, okay? We, we've told Massachusetts multiple times, get rid of that, get rid of that field because people fill it in and then it, it doesn't really translate. It doesn't, it shows up in a couple of places, but um, we, we've created within our outline question, a place for you to provide all, your entire budget justification in one area and Gary will show you that. So I gotta go back to my budget. See, I clicked out of that before hitting save. So now I don't have my line item. So Jean, Parmesan, leave blank. Okay, so there's a rate type. So um, I can do an hourly rate, a day rate, a week rate, a month rate, etc. cetera. Um, whatever you do here is gonna appear also, you're gonna have to explain in your budget justification. So we're just gonna do an hourly rate. Um, we're gonna go $10, uh, let's go $20 an hour and we'll go uh, 100 units. So it calculated $2,000 is the cost, okay? Um, if you wanted to do an hourly rate, uh, it'll do that. And then it's asking you out of that $2,000, how much do you want to charge to the grant? How much do you want to pay out of your federal funds? And say, I'll say $1,500. Um, oh, I thought it would calculate that for me, but it didn't. Okay. And so the remainder is $500. Um, match source and match type. Um, we'll say uh, cash match. Um, and we'll say... Uh, Blue family banana stand is providing the match. So, all right, so the data is saved. Now you can see I have a line item under personnel with fringe benefits. Um, that's probably not the best place for me to put that uh, because I think if you do with fringe benefits, you need to spell out the fringe. Gary will cover that. Uh, but you can see I have my funding, my match funding, the uh, project funds, the total uh, project costs, um, and then I have the match type and the match source. Uh, and then let's say I want to add a line item for travel, airline tickets. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to even put a rate type there. And I'm just going to put, say I budgeted 500 for airline tickets. And um, I'm not using any match there. All right, so you can see now that I'm starting to create um, within these categories specific line items. Uh, and then it'll show me a grand total of council funds, um, a grand total of match funds, and the project funds is the total project, right? So project funds are the federal amount, the match amount that you're generating or providing is the total project cost or project funds. Um, and just quickly, uh, uh, well, I, I think that pro pretty much should cover what you need to do. You can uh, you can edit, you can remove, say you've worked on your budget, you say, oh, I changed my mind, I'm not gonna put this in my budget. Uh, let's, let's add uh, balloons. Okay, so we've got uh, paying the person, um, we're paying for balloons and airline tickets. That's, that's our budget. Uh, you can see I take this very seriously. Okay, so that's, uh, that's your budget. Um, you can edit, remove, you can add within. So if I have more than one personnel with fringe, I can add another one, another person, uh, hours, 50, Thousand. Okay. So now I have both of the both of the people within that uh, category. The work plan. So this is uh, this is another very flexible thing. Um, it can it does tend to confuse po folks a little bit uh, because you uh, have to have an objective, and then within that objective, you have to have listed activities um, and then uh, all of our all of our projects have uh, what we call outputs they, we used to call them performance measures but the 
um, our federal agency changed the terminology to output. Uh, so um, when you're creating your work plan, you um, need to, at, at the very least, have one objective, one activity, and identify an output or performance measure associated with achieving that objective, okay? So the DE suite allows you to provide your own objective ID. So, uh, you know, um, it's essentially you're creating an outline, a template for how you're gonna uh, report your uh, progress on your objective and activities. So an objective ID, that could be A, it could be one. Um, it could be, uh, it could be a, a couple of words, but it's pretty, pretty, um, general to, to objective A and then your activities would be, you know, one, two, three. Some people do objective one and then their activities 1.1, 1 1.2, however you want to do it. Um, but you do need to uh, have an ID and then a description of what that objective is going to be to conduct, uh, how about to plan the day, right? Um, and then there is a date range. So, uh, it's, it's very um, easy to just leave the whole year. Uh, however, um, it's, it is helpful if you say, okay, planning for this, like we will complete this objective within our project year by this date. So um, having an end date, a start and an end date for achieving that objective, I think is helpful. So instead of just putting the end of the year, um, because this event occurs in March, um, hopefully we'll have planning completed by the end of February, okay? So um, I'm gonna do that. And then within the, okay, so I've created an objective. I have objective A. Now I must add an activity and I can add an output, okay? So I need an activity under the objective. So I have objective A, activity one. And um, schedule a planning committee. Uh, how about schedule three planning committee meetings, okay? Um, and then, so we're gonna do that by the end of January. All right, and then we're gonna assign a person that is within the project that is responsible for this activity. So uh, this is where you would put uh, Gene Parmesan, okay? And then you can build uh, your work plan any way you see fit, uh, but it should be built around achieving the objectives that you've uh, identified in your project. You're, you know, you've, you've written out a narrative. Um, now your narrative section is over the five years. Your work plan is gonna be for one year. Same with the budget. Budget's one year, work plan's one year. So we're gonna plan the day. Um, if, if I'm done with planning, I can add a second objective if I want. Um, and that'll be done by um, that'll be done by March 1st. Okay, and Okay, um, great question, Ilka. Ilka's asked if you create one work plan per year. Um, yes, so uh, the, our process is we um, have the notice of funds available um, and it's a competitive process. And uh, we go through this competitive review cycle. Um, within that competitive application is, is uh, the project outline, the project work plan and the budget. Now the work plan and the budget are for one year. Um, towards the end of the first year, uh, if you are the winner of that grant, um, the project staff is going to contact the, you as the grantee organization and say, okay, it's time for our continuation review. 
And so this is now um, up to the grantee organization to create a work plan for year two and a budget for year two. Um, we don't necessarily ask you to um, provide responses to the outline anymore, right? We know what your five-year plan is, but the work plan and the budget are one-year plans. So you might have a progression of, okay, we've, we've completed our objectives in year one. Our objectives in year two might be a little bit different. So you have the creation of a new work plan and you might um, have uh, different uh, intended uses for your budget. So each, uh, we've changed our timeline. So our projects are running October. So sometime around July of every year, uh, the program and fiscal staff are gonna um, contact the, the awarded grantees and say, okay, it's time for our continuation application. And then you would write your work plan and your budget for year two and submit that. And that would undergo review by the council. So the council would say, okay, what have they done this year and what do they plan to do next year? Should they continue? Um, so, hey, Paul. Say, yeah, go ahead. Let me say something real quick. Also, remind them, and, and I'm doing it already, they have to have an objective for the un and underserved section. Thank you. Uh, that section has been kind of weak in some in some proposals as we've been going along. You have to treat that like you would any other section when you do your work plan. There's objective for outreach, and this is what I'm going to do. Boom, 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 boom. So if you do get awarded the grant and it's time to do continuation, or for it's time for us to evaluate what you've done. We can look clearly at what you've done in the outreach section to reach the underserved because that section is updated as well. Am I saying that clearly, Paul? Uh, yeah, that's great. No, thank you for for adding that, Patika. Um, and, and that is, uh, you know, we have a competitive review panel that will review these applications. And one of the questions on their score sheet is, does the work plan include an objective to address the outreach? portion of their application. So um, it will be very important. The council is strengthening the language around requiring our grant applications, grant applications to um, include in their work plan an objective to achieving their um, outreach portion of the, of the grant application. Okay, so I have here um, a planning the day, scheduling legislative visits. I can create as many or as few objectives that I want, uh, you know, granted, I, we, we do want you to have an objective associated with the outreach. Um, I will tell you that this, what you're seeing here, uh, becomes the template for how you report on your progress, okay? So, uh, you know, if you're on a, a four, four, a three month reporting cycle, um, and that's dependent upon how much funding you're awarded from council. If you're on a three, uh, uh, every three months, you a quarterly reporting cycle, you are going to have to come into the template and it's gonna say, okay, objective A was plan the day and you have these activities. How did you do? What did you do? What did you do? Provide an update in writing to the council um, so that we can have it on record. And then we use that to submit up to the federal government um, these are the activities that we undertook to achieve the five-year plan. So um, keep that in mind as you're building your work plan that, you know, if you have 30 objectives, then every quarter, you're going to have to provide an update on your 30 objectives. Uh, it's helpful to have, you know, key objectives and then the activities to achieve those objectives um, within there. And then if you have, as I mentioned before, we have uh, outputs or what used to be known as performance measures. We can add an output to uh, objective B. Um, there's a drop down menu. So um, these are some, some of these measures um, have been added. We don't have them assigned to our projects, uh, but if you think that you can um, accurately capture some of this demographic data, by all means include it. But then you're, we're going to ask you to, to report on, okay, you know, I had 500 people attend the DD day. Here's the demographic um, information. Here's the gender. Here's where they were from. Here's the race and ethnicity. You can include that. It's not required um, in any of our uh, plan language. What you do want to look at is the plan language. What did the council staff say is the goal for this project? 
and I want to match up. I want to match uh, match up that goal. So after participation, I, I apologize. This is you can see it's very hard to see the entire uh, entire goal. So you do want to look at the plan language and say, okay, IFA 2.1A. Um, and if that's in the plan language, the entire description will be provided in the plan language. It's not here, you can't, it just stops because they run out of room. Um, but you can see uh, there are uh, a number of objectives that you can pick from, and then you put your target, your goal that you're going to achieve, okay? So if the plan language says 50 and you say, no, 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 I'm gonna do 75, because um, I wanna beat all of the other applications. Um, you could do that, okay? And so that performance measure, that output will appear here, and then it'll appear on your uh, program report, and we'll be asking you to update that on your reporting cycle. So far, so good. Um, got 15 minutes, good. Okay, so uh, support docs. So we, Fatika mentioned that, uh, that you should include uh, letters of recommendation, uh, the signed assurances, um, the names and addresses of board members if you have that. So you can um, provide notes here like um, in, in addition to being the most qualified, this, uh, this applicant is also handsome. You know, the, you can put whatever you want there. We don't really use that data. Um, it's just additional notes. It's not going to be, it's it's not going to be graded or scored on your grant application. Um, and then um, you have a link down here for supporting documents, so you can click on this, and it'll take you to a new screen on DD Suite. Um, and you can provide a description. So say I say signed assurances. Okay, that's and then I'm gonna. I've scanned it. I'm gonna go find it where I put it on my, um, uh, you know, you can see. Uh, okay, so um, I have now up uploaded my signed assurances. I can edit it, I can change what it is, I can remove it. Um, I can add uh, multiple documents. Uh, give me a second, Stephanie. I'll see. Gary, can you look at that uh, question in the chat? Um, and then, uh, you know, we're just gonna. Okay. And then you should be able to click on that. It'll ask you to download a PDF. So I'm just going to download it. Okay, no. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, yes. Okay, and then I can see, okay, this is what I just uploaded to the DD Suite. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to DD Suite for the board members. It's going to ask me to save it to my computer. And um, boom, you can see uh, that that's been uploaded. You can you can confirm, OK, I've uploaded the correct document. All right, so, um, so I'm going to go back to the summary. And so now all of the stuff that I've entered should now appear on this page. We have the three people. We have responses to all of the outline questions. Um, we have a budget um, with the items that we provided. Um, uh, total, I don't think that I'm gonna meet my minimum matching requirement on this budget, but uh, who knows? Um, I have my work plan and uh, justification notes, note again that we asked for the justification up here in question six of the project outline, um, and Gary will go over that with you folks. 
And then I have my uploaded documents, my uh, signed assurances, my board members, and the, uh, any other things that we require, um, which uh, I think is listed somewhere. Uh, it's listed on the NOFA. Okay, um, so if I'm ready, I can validate and submit. It has been validated. I have completed all of the required um, sections. There are no alerts saying, okay, you're missing something. So I'm gonna submit the application, okay? So it's done, I'm done. Now I cannot, once I submit it, I can't make changes, right? You can't, so if you submit it, you're done. Uh, there's no, uh, oh, I wait, I forgot something. Um, you can't go back into your application and make edits to it. You are done. Okay, I got another question here. Oh, Gary, okay. Um, so you can see now that uh, I've got nothing here. I can go to my applications and see that it was submitted and there's a timestamp. So Patika told you, you have until 11.59 p.m. on July 2nd. The DD suite, I just submitted it a minute ago. It's 11.19 on uh, May 12th. So uh, the DD suite will timestamp it for you. Um, and that's where you can see whether you made the cut or not. Um, if I wanna see my, my application, I can just click on it. Um, if I wanna see the NOFA, I can click here. Um, you know, I mentioned that there are some required application or uh, attachments or no. Uh, requirements. So three letters of recommendation, project director, board members, those are the things that you need to upload. So if I need to go back and go, okay, what am I missing? It's right here in your note in the NOFA. Okay. Okay, so I'm done on the grant side. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of what we see. How do I uh, Uh, there we go. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of what we see on the DE Council side. Okay, so, um, so you, I can see here that an application has been submitted. So this is what's going to happen once your grant comes in. The application has been submitted. So I'm going to pull it up. And then uh, the council staff is going to review it for complete, completeness, which it should be complete. The DD suite really won't let you submit an incomplete application. However, we have received applications to a NOFA that was for the wrong grant, right? So we've had an application submitted for the DD day, and it was really for the transportation project, or it was for something entirely not even related to the project. Uh, I've had an application for purchasing cell phones or of some sort that was had nothing to do with the project. Um, so the staff will review that and then they will uh, provide a copy of it to the grant review panel. Um, and then let's say that they undergo the review and they do say, hey, uh, we, in, in order for you to, um, in order for you to receive this grant, we've selected you. However, we're gonna place a condition on you. Um, and let's say that they noted that the budget did not meet the minimum matching requirement, okay? So what they're gonna do is they're gonna request a modification to the budget, okay? And it says, please provide minimum match. Okay, and I'm gonna unlock all of the sections of their budget Okay, um, and that was that's it, right? That's all they're asking for. Got lots of stuff going on. The minimum matching requirement is generally 25% um, for non-poverty counties, um, and for poverty county, it's 10%. Is it 10%, Gary? I mean, if you're within the two counties that are listed in that booklet that I mentioned. Right, 10% if, if solely performed, if the activities are solely performed in one or both of those counties. Correct. So um, you can see that I've gone in here and now I have a modification request. Now, 
um, within within my application, I don't see anything yet. I, I have mods requested on this other project, but um, you'll generally be contacted by the council staff saying, congratulations, you have been awarded. Here's, a, here's your conditions letter. Um, and the conditions letter will say, hey, we really like your project, except that you're missing, you're not meeting the minimum matching requirement. So we will be um, sending back to you your application within DD Suite for you to fix this, okay? So what that looks like um, is I'm gonna request modifications. Okay. All right, so back over in um, Bluth Family Bananas stands um, DD Suite. I now have a new notification. Um, you can also, uh, if you have a lot of stuff going on in DD Suite, you can do this drop down and say, show me only um, uh, account messages or I have none of that, show all. So I have a new modification request for DD Awareness and Advocacy Day, okay? Um, and so I'm like, okay, what am I doing here? Where, where are my mods requested? So I've scrolled down the budget, says please provide minimum match. This is where uh, a lot of people get caught up. They go, okay, uh, there's no edit here. How do I, how do I edit this? That's telling me provide minimum match, but I, it won't let me click in here. Um, that's because we have to do it in the budget tab. Remember I said at the beginning that we have these tabs. So in order to edit the budget, we'll click to the budget tab. Um, and then you can see, please provide minimum match. And now I can edit the line item, okay? So uh, what did I have? I had uh, another person. So we're gonna add um, some match for this other person. Stuff out of the way. Okay, so now um, if I go back to my summary, let's see if I have 25% minimum match. I've met my minimum matching requirement now. I've, so I've adjusted my budget to accommodate the, um, the request. And now I can resubmit. Oh, um, before I do that. So you notice that I requ only requested modifications for the budget, okay? So if I get my thing back and say, oh, I, for I forgot I was, going to, um, I was going to write some stuff in here, it won't let me edit uh, these sections. Okay, because I did not unlock those sections for modification. Okay, so um, if you feel you've been awarded and you do want to edit something, um, you know, we generally try not to do that because you were reviewed by a review panel and they selected you based on what you submitted. So having you change that after the fact um, uh, is why this is locked. We, we don't want you to do that. Um, however, if there are like, uh, as we go down the road, there are like uh, budget corrections and things like that. We have a process to, to follow that and make edits to your grant. So that is in essence, um, so I would validate and resubmit that, okay? And that is in essence, the grant application, what may happen if you are selected um, you may not be awarded um, and uh, you'll be contacted by the staff. Are there any questions associated? I saw there were a few in the chat, but are there any questions about the DD suite, the application process, uh, the account registration? All right. Uh, slam dunk. <laughs> okay, um, I'm not sure what is next. Oh, preparing a budget. Let me get that up on your screen for you. And And I'll hand that. Uh, is that what you, is this you, Gary? 
This is me, Paul. Thank you. Do you not want this? Let me. You you wanted to show your own screen. Is that correct? No, actually, you you can do the slides. Uh, it would be much easier, yeah, for you to take take control of the slides. I'll just let you know okay. when you move forward. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Paul mentioned, my name is Gary Groom. Uh, I'm the financial program manager with Council. Uh, today, I get to share a little with you about your project budgets, uh, some of the rules and regulations for Council's grants, uh, and just some general financial information uh, as you prepare your proposal. Uh, so if you're ready, we can get started. Um, it's our hope that you can leave here today with a solid foundation of information that's helpful to you uh, as you move through this grants process. Uh, next slide. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time covering things that have already been covered. Uh, I do want to stress here, though, please carefully read through the notice of funds available before submitting your application. Uh, be sure to pay uh, particular attention to any requirements, uh, things you may need to submit with your application, uh, the amount of funding available for a particular grant, um, any NOFA attachments, um, and please take note of any deadlines. Um, unfortunate things can happen to good proposals uh, that don't follow NOFA instructions. Uh, next slide. Gary, make sure you speak up. You're so soft-spoken. It's like you're fading in and out just a little. Maybe that's just me and my old ears. I will do my best, Fatika. Um, eligibility. Uh, not a whole lot to say here. There are no restrictions on who may apply for a council grant. Um, if you or your organization has a project idea that fits with council's description for a particular grant, uh, you are more than welcome to apply. Uh, there are some things, however, that may disqualify an applicant from receiving a council grant award. Uh, and those are listed here on the slide. Uh, the first being if an applicant is indebted to the federal government or has a judgment lien filed against it, um, another disqualifying event, if an applicant has an unresolved finding for recovery with the state of Ohio. Um, and if you're unsure about this, you can look this up on the Ohio Auditor of State website. Um, there's a link, um, a findings for recovery link uh, where you can search. Um, and lastly, applicants that are federally suspended or debarred, um, they are prohibited from receiving a council grant award. Next. Uh, just a few application requirements uh, I wanted to make sure everyone is aware of. Um, I'll just touch on a few of these here real quickly. Uh, the DUNS number, Paul mentioned the DUNS number earlier, um, and I'm going to go back here real quick. There, there is one exception to, to needing a DUNS number in the regulation, but it does not apply uh, to council applicants. So, so that being so, all applicants will be required to have um, a valid data universal numbering system number. Um, and for those of you not familiar, uh, a DUNS number is simply a unique nine digit number uh, that's used to identify your business. Um, DUNS registration is relatively easy. Uh, you're asked to provide some information about your organization, uh, things like your organization's name, uh, location, contact information, uh, things of that nature. Um, obtaining a DUNS number is always free. Uh, please be aware, however, there are a number of websites that offer to help you with the process for a fee. Um, I've never used any of them, so I can't say anything about their services, uh, but I do know you are not required to pay anyone to get a DUNS number. Next. Uh, along with getting a DUNS number, uh, applicants are also required to register and maintain an active SAM registration throughout the application process. Uh, SAM is short for System for Award Management. Uh, it's a government website uh, that's used, at least for our purposes anyways, uh, during the awarding of Council's federal grants. Um, if you are awarded a Council grant, a SAM registration must remain active throughout the life of the award. Um, and similar to getting a DUNS number, registering with SAM is simply a matter of providing some information about your organization and business. Um, and also like the DUNS number, it is free to register with SAM. Uh, again, I am sure there are websites that are willing to help you with the registration process for a fee, uh, but it is not necessary to pay anyone to register. Uh, and one more thing about SAM and DUNS. Uh, if, you, if you don't yet have a DUNS number or you haven't yet registered with SAM, 
um, I would suggest you not wait too long. Um, be sure to give yourself sufficient time to register, um, or if you already have an existing registration um, that you may need to renew, uh, give yourself plenty of time to do that. Um, starting now will give you, give you plenty of time just in case any issues arise. Um, and as always, uh, you can always find more detailed information uh, on both the DUNS numbers and SAM registration uh, in our grantee guidelines. Um, moving right along the list here, uh, and both actually one, can you go back real quick and just a couple more things here, Paul, thanks. Um, Paul and Fatika mentioned both of these, most of these, so I'm just gonna go through them really quickly. Um, uh, applicants do need to submit uh, three letters of recommendation. Um, also the resume of the project director, names of the applicants board members, if there is a governing board, uh, proof of nonprofit status. Uh, if this applies to your organization, um, a couple of examples of acceptable documentation. Uh, this could be a copy of a current IRS tax exemption certificate um, or a certified copy of your organization's certificate of incorporation uh, if it clearly establishes that nonprofit status. Uh, next on the list, uh, a copy of the applicant's current federally negotiated indirect cost rate agreement. Um, this applies if you have a current rate um, and you'll be requesting indirect costs. Um, and lastly, a signed copy of council's assurances form. Um, and this is just a document that spells out many of the terms and conditions uh, if you're successful in being awarded a council grant. Next. Funding restrictions, uh, just a couple of restrictions to mention. Um, as of this past August, uh, the federal government issued a ban on the use of federal grants to purchase telecommunications equipment and services from certain entities. Uh, this includes the Huawei Technologies Company and the ZTE Corporation. Um, if you're looking for more information about the ban, I believe, uh, and I think I got a copy, just last week, the Office of Management and Budget uh, they released a new set of frequently asked questions uh, that expands on the applications of the ban. Uh, so that was the, that would be the first place I'd look um, for more information. Uh, I also wanted to mention it is specifically prohibited that any grant recipient profit from a council grant award. Uh, the uniform guidance explains that profit is any amount in excess of allowable direct and indirect costs. Uh, we mainly only see this with for-profit applicants that don't have a lot of federal grant experience, uh, but it does come up, so I wanted to mention it here today. Next. Uh, so now we can we can finally talk a little bit about a little bit about the budget. Um, I imagine we're all pretty familiar with what a budget is. Uh, in general, it's a financial plan that covers a specific period of time. Uh, it usually includes all expected costs uh, and identifies the sources of funding being used for a particular project. Uh, a well-constructed budget reflects and supports the ideas and activities contained in the narrative sections of the proposal. Next. So where can you go if you have specific questions preparing your grant budget? Um, aside from our grantee guidelines, uh, the best resource for the rules and regulations for council's federal grants uh, can be found in what's called the Uniform Administrative Requirements cost principles and audit requirements for HHS awards, uh, or what is more commonly referred to as the uniform guidance. Uh, you can see on the slide, uh, it's also referred to as 45 CFR part 75. Um, and this is just the version of the uniform guidance uh, adopted by the US Department of Health and Human Services, which is where council funding originates. Uh, this is gonna be your most complete resource to finding the answers to your questions um, as it covers the complete life cycle of a grant award from beginning to end. Um, and you can find it on the internet at the website here on the slide uh, or by simply entering the title into any internet search engine. Next. So in order to keep things timely today, uh, I'm only gonna go over a few key parts of the uniform guidance. Uh, the first place I'd like to start is called the cost principles. Uh, the cost principles can best be described as a tool to help determine whether a particular cost can be charged to your federal award. Uh, so to determine if a cost is allowable, uh, these following four questions should be asked. Uh, the first question, is the cost necessary and reasonable? 
Uh, is it required for project performance? And is the cost no greater than what someone would normally pay for the same good or service? Uh, next question, is the cost allocable? Does the good or service being purchased advance the work of the grant? Next, is the cost consistent? Will this cost be handled in the same manner as similar costs within the organization? Uh, and finally, does the cost conform? Does this purchase follow the rules and regulations for this specific federal award? Um, a yes to each of these questions should provide you a high level of assurance that a particular cost is allowable. Next. This slide just shows some of the more common allowable and unallowable grant charges. Uh, the left side of the chart um, shows costs that are often seen in grant applications. Uh, this includes compensation, professional services, supplies, uh, you'll see travel costs. Uh, on the right side of the chart are costs that need to be avoided. Things like alcohol, uh, bad debts, entertainment and lobbying. These are things that all fall into the category of unallowable grant charges. Um, and if you're looking for a more complete listing of allowable and unallowable costs, uh, I'd recommend looking in the uniform guidance um, under subpart E cost principles. Um, and you can also find some of those things in our grantee guidelines. Next. The next step in building your budget is to determine whether each grant cost is a direct cost or an indirect cost. Uh, direct costs are the easy ones. They can be identified specifically to a particular project or award with a high degree of accuracy. Uh, some examples of direct costs include salaries and wages for project staff, uh, the hiring of a contractor specifically for a project, um, and any related project staff travel expenses. Uh, these are costs that clearly and directly benefit uh, the grant supported project. Next. Uh, many organizations, however, have costs that benefit multiple programs, um, costs that cannot easily and accurately be allocated to a specific program or grant. Um, these are costs that are usually treated as indirect costs. Um, some common indirect costs here you can see on the slide uh, include management and administrative staff salaries, uh, human resources costs, uh, accounting, legal, and IT department costs as well as facilities maintenance and operations costs. Uh, so even though these costs may not be directly identifiable to a project or program, um, a fair share of their costs can be applied to federal awards. Next. So just how is this done? Um, a couple of different ways. Uh, the first way, some organizations already have what is called a federally negotiated indirect cost rate. Uh, this is a rate that the federal government allows an organization to charge indirect costs to a federal grant. Um, if you do have a current rate agreement and you plan on using this rate for your grant, um, you do need to submit a copy of that agreement uh, with your application. Uh, a second method for charging indirect costs uh, is one that was actually introduced in the uniform guidance, um, and it's referred to as the de minimis rate. Um, and this is a rate that is equal to 10% of a project's total, or excuse me, modified total direct costs. Uh, the use of the de minimis rate is only available uh, to those entities that do not have a current federally negotiated indirect cost rate. Next. Uh, indirect costs can be a confusing topic. Uh, so please remember a few things, um, all costs, including indirect costs must be handled consistently. Uh, if you choose to use the de minimis rate for a project, you must continue to do so for any other federal awards that you apply for. Um, costs included in a federally negotiated indirect cost rate or the de minimis rate may also not be charged as a direct cost elsewhere in the budget. Um, and more information on charging indirect costs to your grant award uh, can be found in the grantee guidelines. This brings us to the topic of match. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with the term, uh, match is simply the contribution of the grantee towards the total project costs. Um, all match contributions must follow the same rules as grant charges. 
Uh, if you want to think back to the earlier cost principles that I mentioned um, a little bit ago, um, and the four questions to determine if a cost is allowable, um, is the cost necessary and reasonable? Is it allocable? Uh, will it be handled consistently? Uh, and does it conform to limitations? Um, you should be able to answer yes to these questions for all match contributions as well. Um, and if an item is unallowable as a grant charge, it is unallowable to be used as a match. Next. So how do you know how much match you have to provide for your project? Uh, Paul touched on this a little bit. Uh, generally, a grantee is required to provide 25% of the total project costs as match. Uh, the easiest way to do this is to divide the total grant award amount by three. Um, and as you can see on the slide on the left, uh, a $75,000 grant award has a match requirement of $25,000. Uh, the total project costs, which can be figured out by adding the grant award amount and the match requirement together uh, for this project are $100,000. Uh, in $25,000 is 25% of that $100,000 total project cost. Uh, as Paul mentioned, there, there is one exception when it comes to determining a match requirement. If a grant project is performed solely in a federally designated poverty county, the match requirement is reduced uh, from 25% to 10% of the total project costs. Um, and to calculate this, uh, you take the grant award amount and instead of dividing it by three, you divide it by nine. Um, you can see on the right side of the slide, that same $75,000 grant award, um, if the activities are performed in a designated poverty county, now has a match requirement of only $8,334. Uh, the total project costs for this award are $83,334. Um, and if you do the math, you can see that that $8,334 is 10% of those total project costs. Next. Uh, Ohio currently has two counties that are designated poverty counties. Uh, this means that 20% or more of the population in these counties is living below the poverty level. Uh, if the work of your project will occur solely in one or both of those counties, your match requirement will be 10% of the project costs. Um, if not, that 25% requirement will apply to your project. Um, and just as a side note, new data on these is released annually and that can affect your match requirements. Uh, future updates may result in the inclusion of other poverty counties uh, or the removal of current counties uh, for any particular year. Um, and that information will be dispersed annually as soon as it becomes available. Next. Okay, uh, so now you know what match is and you know how much match you need for your project. Uh, what else is there to know about match? Uh, just a couple of things. Match generally comes in one of two forms, cash match or in-kind match. Uh, cash match is any direct cash contribution provided by the grantee for a project. Um, in-kind match is typically the fair market value of donated goods and services. Um, and it usually comes from an outside third party. Um, it's the value of something received or donated to a project that doesn't have a direct cost associated with it. And if you go to the next slide, Paul. Uh, here we have a couple of examples um, of some common in-kind contributions. Uh, you'll see volunteer time, uh, any donated supplies and goods, uh, as well as donated equipment and labor. Um, and I've put here on the slide, uh, it's important to remember that it's the value of the work being performed uh, that determines what the fair market value is. Uh, so for example, the CEO of a Fortune 500 company painting a fence uh, for your project, uh, that can only be valued at an amount consistent with what you would ordinarily pay someone to paint a fence, uh, not what she earns as CEO of her company. Um, and on top of that, all decisions regarding fair market value for in-kind contributions must be documented and retained in your grant records. Next. Just a few comments to wrap up the subject of match. Uh, grant match can be in the form of cash, in-kind, or a combination of both. 
Unpaid individuals and volunteers who work on a grant project may have the fair market value of their contributions counted as match. Um, and it's important to know you cannot use federal funds or individuals paid with federal funds as match on your council grant. Uh, further, you cannot count any match to your council grant that has, used, that has been used as match on another federally funded program. Next. Uh, and we finally made it to the budget justification part of the application. Uh, this is your chance to explain all of the costs included in your project budget. Uh, please be sure to include a justification for all match charges, as well as for all grant funded charges. Uh, if equations or formulas are used to determine figures in the budget, those equations or formulas should be included in the justification. Uh, be sure that each item is clearly and specifically described within the scope of the project. Um, and it's good practice to refer to the budget justification section of the grantee guidelines when you're completing your justification. Um, there you'll find a description of the desired format that we're looking for um, and the level of detail expected. And so Paul, if, if you can pull up that DD suite sample budget and justification that, that I created, that would be great. Yeah, Gary, give me just a second here. Sure, sure, no problem. Got multiple screens going here. Yeah, I'd like to be able to show everybody just what, what each looks like um, so they have a sample when they're completing their application. Okay, and so when you get that up, can we just scroll down to the actual project budget? We'll start there. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so this is what a completed project budget might look like. Uh, this is just a simple budget that I put together here quickly. Um, you'll see there's some personnel charges um, with fringe benefits, um, a subcontract. Uh, there's some supplies and some travel. Um, and down at the bottom, I've also included some indirect costs and volunteer services. Uh, you can see that the costs are divided uh, by how they're going to be paid, whether they'll be paid using the grant dollars um, or as match. Um, and as Paul showed you earlier, you can enter the match source, whether it's an internal or external source, um, and the match type, uh, whether it's cash or incline, or excuse me, in-kind. Um, and again, Paul mentioned this earlier. Uh, notice we don't have anything here in the justification section here on the project budget. Um, as Paul mentioned earlier, that's a total separate section um, of the application. And there you go, Paul, if we scroll up there, you can see question six of the outline. Um, this is a, a sample budget justification that I put together for that sample application. Um, and so you can see here, uh, we've got all of the costs listed um, as they appear on the project budget. Uh, there's a description of the costs, any formulas used um, and the amounts that are gonna be charged to the grant. Uh, I think we've also got here um, a breakdown for how much of each item is going to be charged to the grant um, and how much is gonna be charged to match. Um, and each charge that's included in that project budget below has a justification here. Um, and if you wanna just scroll through there, we can take a second to look at all of those. So if you want to jump back now to uh, that last slide, Paul, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, I know that was a lot of information. Thanks to everybody for your time. Um, on this slide, we've got contact information for Robin, Ship, and myself. Um, we are available right now for any general grant questions. Um, more specific questions I'd recommend uh, be discussed with a financial professional who's familiar with your organization's business, um, along with the rules and regulations contained in the uniform guidance. Um, but if you do have any questions, and it looks like there might be a couple, um, we can take a look at those. Yeah, Gary, there were two questions in the chat. Um, the first one being, is there a cap on the F and A 
Um, I don't know if that's uh, indirect costs. I think the uh, universities called it a little bit different, but uh, F, can you address the F and A? Uh, yes, yeah, thanks, Paul. So, so F and A um, is a, a unique term for indirect costs. Um, you'll find it especially in the university setting. Um, it stands for facilities and administration, um, but it does stand in place of, of what you might find a, a typical indirect cost rate. Um, we do not have a cap on our indirect cost rate. Uh, we prescribe to the uniform guidance um, and we are required to honor all um, currently federally negotiated indirect cost rates. As a follow-up to that, um, if, if a if a recipient of the grant is collaborating with subcontractors, um, are the subcontractors required to follow the same uh, budget requirements than the prime applicant in terms of match and F&A rates? So subcontractors are not required to follow the same rules that our, that our direct grant recipients are required to follow. Um, the one, thing you, the, the one thing you do have to be aware of um, is the difference between a subcontract and a subaward. Now, if, if you do potentially want to subaward some of the work, the recipients of your subaward are going to be required to follow these same rules and regulations um, that, that you are. It flows down to, the, to those recipients. Um, so you, you have to make a clear distinction between what is a subcontract and what is a subaward. All right, and then we had another question. Um, would a fiscal agent be an indirect cost? Does, does that qualify under the MTDC? So a fiscal agent, and this is almost a, a specific question, um, but a fiscal agent in general, you're going to have some type of um, agreement set up um, for that entity to be providing services. Um, in most cases, that's probably some type of subcontract, um, or at least the, the terms of that agreement would be laid out in some type of subcontract. Um, so as a subcontract, um, those costs would not necessarily be part of an indirect cost. Um, but again, it, it, it really depends on, on your specific financial situation. Uh, your organization may have a fiscal agent for, for everything you do, um, and then it becomes a different story. So I can't really specifically answer that question. Um, In a general training program. <laughs> right, yes. Um, and then we have one, one additional question. Is there a current standard hourly value for volunteer hours? Um, so we don't, we don't necessarily prescribe to any specific value. Uh, what we like to encourage grantees to do is to try to um, place a fair market value on the services that, that, that those volunteers um, are providing. Um, now, I know there are some instances where, where that is just not possible. Um, so, so in those cases, um, we like to encourage grantees to um, find another source um, to possibly try to value uh, that time. There are a number of websites that provide information um, specifically on um, volunteer time uh, in terms of uh, both for the state of Ohio um, as well as in certain metropolitan regions. Uh, so, so we would not say you can't use that. If, if that's what you have to re resort to to be able to Put a value on that time um, as long as you substantiate that um, and as long as you keep those records um, then then we would be okay with that and those are all of the questions for fiscal Ken, are you here? Yes, I'm right here, Paul. Thank All you. right. Thank you very much. I knew Gary was going to do that to me, but we'll just keep right on moving. Uh, my name is Ken Latham, 
and I am the staff person for uh, outreach for the uh, DD Council. Um, we have had the pleasure of pursuing this effort, being involved in this effort for the past 20 years. I know a lot of agencies and a lot of uh, companies are now doing uh, outreach, diversity and inclusion or cultural competence and things of that nature. And uh, we have tried to pursue all these efforts over the past 20 years. So it's, uh, it's not just a, a, a new venture for us. Um, so the Ohio DD Council has been trying to um, help with the disability community and try to bring more people to the table as possible with our outreach effort. Um, going with the first, going with the first uh, slide here, uh, the federal act requires council to make a special effort in outreach to unserved and underserved populations. Now, I wanna just, just read something to you real quick. That's not on the slide, so just please just stick with me here. And it is the policy of the United States that all programs, projects, and activities receiving assistance under this title shall be carried out in a manner consistent with the principles that recruitment efforts in disciplines related to developmental disabilities, relating to pre-service training, community training, practice administration, and policy making must focus on bringing a larger number of racial and ethnic minorities into disciplines in the order to provide appropriate skills, knowledge, role models, and sufficient personnel to address the growing needs in increasing diverse populations. And that means increased diverse populations as it relates to council. So we're not just making these things up. This is a part of the federal DD Act, federal statute. And uh, we um, like to include our grantees to help us with this mission. And um, so, uh, because we wanted 100% uh, buy-in. Paul, would you go to the next uh, slide, please? Okay, what is the mission of outreach? Along with your help, we are attempting to maintain an, an equitable agency uh, of diversity and, in, and inclusion. Um, by reaching out to unserved and underserved populations. Um, as, as part of the grantee activity, uh, as we observe the grantee responsibility concerning reaching out to unserved and underserved populations, we hope that these, these populations will have an opportunity to participate in the program activities of our grantees. And again, this is an effort uh, by council to include all entities that are a part of the Ohio DD Council's outreach effort, a part of the Ohio DD Council's grantee funding process. Uh, this is uh, an area that will cross cut all of our grants, not just in the outreach section. As uh, some of the other co my coworkers mentioned, there will be nine questions um, on your grant application that uh, you will you will have to uh, answer that is required for you to answer. So it's it's a council effort to use all committees, all grantees, all council members and staff to accomplish our outreach mission. Can we go to the next uh, slide, Paul? Okay. The question is why is out why is uh, outreach so important? To, uh, to those populations to know about council or to participate in council activities. Well, again, we go back to the federal mandate. Again, like I said, we, uh, we're not making this stuff up and it's a part of our federal mandate. But to make it more simple, I always usually say those populations are, 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 are taxpayers also. And I'm very passionate about the work that we do uh, 
in, in outreach and in bringing in unserved and underserved uh, populations. In Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, that any actually says anybody who's again receiving federal funding shall not uh, discriminate. And for those reasons, everyone should have a chance to be at the table. This is this is plain and simple. Um, anybody who's a part of our society and our, our taxpayers should have an opportunity to not only be at the table, but you will find that when you have a, a variety of opinions and people working from different uh, uh, ethnic groups and populations, you will have also a brighter uh, uh, and broader understanding of, of the work that the council does and everybody's effort to be an advocate for the disability community. And excuse me, I'm just, a lot of times I just get, uh, go, a little further than what the uh, uh, slide slide says in the PowerPoint. Um, unserved and under, underserved populations are people with disabilities who are not a part of the mainstream disability community as advocates. And sometimes they're people who lack good service providers. Uh, Paul, uh, next slide, please. A lot of times uh, when we say service providers, lack good service providers, a lot of people who are in the unserved and underserved uh, populations sometimes don't know how to navigate the system in order to get the services that, uh, that they need to get. So, uh, so we're here as a disability, as a part of the disability community to help uh, resolve some of those issues for people with disabilities who are in unserved and underserved populations. Now, uh, what defines unserved and underserved populations? This is very, very important to you because a lot of times it helps if people think that it's just a black and white issue. It's, it's not just a black and white issue. It's individuals from racial and ethnic minority back, backgrounds, uh, disadvantaged individuals, um, individuals with limited English proficiency, individuals from unserved geographic areas, rural and urban, uh, specific groups of individuals within the population of individuals with disabilities, including individuals who require assistive technology to participate in and contribute to uh, community life, ethnic, and cultural and disability groups that typically do not receive services and supports because of language or cultural barriers. People without a voice because they are such a small percentage of the population or people who are isolated from the mainstream disability community. So those, that definition kind of helps uh, you to target in on the grants that you will be applying for. Now with the outreach uh, specific grants, uh, your, your targeted populations are, 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 are lined up for you. But for anybody who is doing other grants in the other uh, committees, uh, you will have to uh, you kind of use these guidelines to go by to help you kind of select your population of unserved and underserved uh, population. The other thing that is very, very important is that you have to understand sometimes we get people who are coming to council who are applying for uh, council grants and, and, and are, are awarded council grants. Oftentimes they say people with disability are unserved and underserved population. Well, we want you to understand that there is a subgroup that, that is within the disability community that really uh, uh, applies to that unserved and underserved populations that we should be looking at. And so we want you to kind of keep that in mind that will help you again, uh, uh, reach out and, and apply to uh, uh, different unserved and underserved populations within your community. Can we uh, go to the next slide, Paul? Outreach grants. Now this is 
kind of geared towards outreach grants, but we want you to understand that anyone who is awarded an outreach grants based upon the purpose of that outreach grants will already have a target, targeted population uh, uh, for you. The outreach grants are different than any other grant projects in the, uh, in the DD Council. As for your grants, as for the other grants, your other grants will have to declare what unserved and underserved populations you will target in your program. And that basically uh, revolves around, you know, people in your area, where you live, your community, your county, your city, in terms of what populations you see that are unserved and underserved. So, and, and those of you who are applying specifically for outreach grants, you will have to declare those particular populations. So that just gives you an idea, again, those guidelines that I just read to you at the prior slide is gives you an idea of the, of the, uh, the population that you will target or you can target. Uh, next slide, please. Now, these are the nine questions. These are the nine questions that will ap uh, appear on your grant application. Um, these are questions that you are required to answer. There are a lot of them are plenty uh, uh, are, are really self-explanatory, but there are probably one or two you might have some questions about. So let's we'll start at the uh, well. Let's read the the the. the the statement before. Unserved and underserved populations are children and adults with disabilities whose voices are not heard and because no one asks, whose opinions are discounted, are a small percentage of the population, or isolated from the mainstream. Here are the sub-questions. Who are the unserved and underserved populations in your project area? Again, uh, as you fill out the grant application, you have to think about who are the unserved and underserved quite naturally in your project area. And will these, this particular population be a group that you would want to be, that you would want involved in your program activities? Number two, identify the unserved and underserved population that you plan to serve. Well, you may have several uh, specific groups and you don't have to, to serve all of them. You just can pick out one underserved, underserved population in your area and, um, and put that on your application that this is the particular group that you plan to serve. Number three is describe their needs and any barriers to service. If you know this population and, and when you become involved in this population, you will quite naturally sit down and discuss with them what their needs are and what they feel that are any barriers to uh, services that, um, that they encounter in their particular community. Describe the affirmative and protect, proactive outreach activities you will perform. In other words, what, um, are the positive, what are the progressive, what are the aggressively uh, uh, activities that you will use to attract your targeted uh, uh, population to your program? Um, just describe uh, for that question, you know, what, what activities you will uh, provide to get those people involved in some of the work that you're doing as a, as a DD Council uh, uh, grantee. Then the other thing is that you know what uh, your program activities involve, then you put down what are your expected outcomes uh, for your pro program activities. Describe that in, in your question. Another thing that we would like you to do is that when you're doing your outreach, you know, list the key community people and organizations uh, you will become involved in, in the unserved and underserved populations. The various, whether it's urban league, uh, whether it's community uh, services, uh, directors or ex uh, 
maybe the governor is certain, maybe uh, senators or Congress people, uh, anybody of, of any stature that can help you, you know, get to certain populations that are unserved and underserved, you um, please uh, list them on your uh, on your grant application and in your reports uh, that you will eventually be uh, uh, expected to uh, uh, report on uh, whether it's uh, three times a year or whether it's just twice a year. Number six, what are your plans to sustain outreach activities? Uh, this one can be a little touchy sometimes, but if you have any plans that after you leave uh, council grant uh, funding process, what have you done? What have you done or what will you do to make sure that your, your efforts, your program activities, your contact with the uh, unserved and underserved uh, populations remain long after you're no longer a council grantee. So that's, that's important also, because we like to think that, you know, our work is being sustained as grantees long after we're gone uh, from doing the work that uh, we have done in the community. Number seven, how will you measure, how will you measure progress towards your outreach goals? Well, you know, by the time you select your your, your population, declare your population, find out what their barriers are, find out what their needs are. It's gonna be pretty easy, hopefully, for you to be able to measure their success. You hope that they are much better off in terms of being involved, not only in your project activities, but uh, their awareness as it relates to uh, the Ohio Developmental Disabilities Council. So we hope that uh, you can measure your progress by the work that only you have done. Number eight, what process will you use to address unforeseen barriers and list those barrier examples? Well, you have, you know, worked in the, in the workforce for a long time and lots of times in our, in our circumstances, in our life's work, we've come across unforeseen barriers that are Unexpected. That's why they're unforeseen barriers. And so you can probably just list some of the things how you handle, you know, you you review the situation, you assess the situation, you you sit down and talk, or if if it's, if it's not an individual, you monitor what caused the problem, and then you decide how you're going to you're going to deal with it. And so when you have this grant and you come across those, uh, those circumstances, please list those barriers as examples so we will know as a uh, monitoring uh, uh, entity that we knew how you resolve your problems and how you took care of the situations that you didn't expect to, to happen. Uh, and number nine, to the extent possible, as you engage in your work, Report any disparities you find among individuals with disabilities from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. And basically that's pretty self-explanatory that you in your work, you will find out that uh, what disparities uh, that this population is facing. It could be health disparities. It could be a number of, of uh, disparities or prejudices that have might kept them from getting uh, um, good service uh, and things of that nature. So it just talks about listing those disparities that you come across uh, in your work with the uh, unserved and underserved pro uh, population. And again, this is not only just for the outreach grants, but this will be uh, for all of your grants when you encounter this, these questions in section four that you, you will have to fill out. One of the other things that uh, was basically for outreach grants specifically, but if you are receiving an outreach grant, instead of reporting every quarter um, during a year, you will only have to report two times a year, the first six months, and then uh, the last month uh, of the year. 
based upon the funding uh, allocation that are part of their outreach grants. So that's uh, kind of it for this, this presentation in terms of the overall expectations of the grants that you will be applying for uh, uh, from council. Uh, later on this afternoon, when we have our breakout sessions, we will talk more specifically about the outreach grants themselves. So if uh, there's any questions in the chat, uh, Paul, that you can see, please let me know. And uh, Yes, again, yes. Uh, we have a question. Would those isolated from mainstream include people who live where transportation is a big challenge? Um, so I think that's a question as would that population qualify under the, the definitions of outreach or un, un and underserved? Um, they would definitely, <laughs> they would definitely be underserved in a certain area as, as you're talking about in terms of transportation. Uh, geographic, yeah, location. geographic location is, is more, is more like it, Paul. Yeah, if they're in a geographic location that they have no transportation whatsoever, uh, whatsoever then that would be more uh, of, of the niche uh, in terms of unserved populations. Now, if they live in, a, in an area where they have transportation, whether it's, it's a uh, um, cab or buses or whatever the case may be, and they, you know, just don't have the funding at this point in time to do it you're not really dealing with a population that have absolutely no transportation. That would be an issue that they would have to resolve themselves. But like you said, geographic location is, is like Appalachia, things of those natures that you're dealing with a more, uh, um, you know, specific population and location, which is rural, rural and, uh, that would be very difficult. I hope I answered that question. Okay, well, uh, we have a, another question that's come in. Um, is LGBTQ community considered un underserved? Uh, you know, we one of the things that we did, one of the things that we did with the LGBTQ community is that we have learned over the past year and a half that we wanted to lock in on LGBTQ specifically for people with disabilities and people of color. We do know that there are services that people with disability in the LGBTQ community are, may not be getting and people of color may not be getting. And that's one of the reasons why we are developing the white paper, the first and as, as part of the uh, primary source of trying to determine how we will have to address some of these issues because they're issues that council has never dealt with before. So we're hoping our white paper can determine and tell us what, uh, what those issues are. Now, Ken, may I say something? Yeah, uh, also, it's just been in like the last 10 years that our federal funding source has asked us to do something with LGBT2 because we never have. It's one of the questions, are you reaching out to the LGBTQ? So if someone happens to do a proposal that's not in Ken's grant, but it's in another committee, and you want to say you want to talk with the LGBTQ, you can, but you, you'll have to develop you know, why you have selected them, what have you found out about them in that area as to what their barriers are as you answer the question. So overall, yes, our funding stores have just selected them as, as one of the groups that they feel are being un and underserved. So yes. There are uh, no other questions in the chat, uh, but if, if you do have a question for Ken or the outreach section, sure. I, I, I'll, say, I'll say from my perspective, I get more questions about uh, on my grant applications. What, what is this? How do, I, how do I address this? And I do have to walk folks through it. So now's your chance. You got the pro. 
on uh, on video, you can put them on the spot and ask them a question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think, Paul, most of the time, like you say, uh, when it comes to these these questions, uh, and 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 uh, one question that we get all the time is that, like I said, some people will just say people with disabilities are unserved and underserved populations without realizing that there are subgroups within that populations that, uh, that aren't being addressed at all. People with disabilities, for the most part, uh, are within the mainstream community. Now, how they choose to navigate that uh, is, is one thing, but then there's people in that subgroup, in that group that are, we consider subgroup that don't know how to, uh, to navigate. A, a lot of people don't know anything about counsel. A lot of people have not received uh, a lot of services that, uh, that they were, uh, aware that they could get and we don't know why that is so that's why we use the grantees to to help us at, because they the grantees are many and they are in those communities and uh, and so they can help us with uh, these particular answers we don't have all the answers we don't have all the answers and that's why we we we're, we're doing outreach one of the things i would like to note in particular would be aware of this, uh, you know, I don't know, I can't remember, Paul, if you were on council, had gotten to council at, at, uh, or not, but we sent out 6,000 surveys one, one time. We got sent out 6,000 surveys to ask agencies, companies, hospitals, whatever, uh, did they, at that time, this has been a long time ago, now hospitals and now agencies, everybody's everybody's doing outreach now. But at the time when we sent these surveys out, we got about 600 responses. And one of the questions, one simple question that we asked them was, did they do outreach? Did they do outreach? Did they go outside, did they go into their community? as an agency, as a hospital, as uh, any kind of particular professional entity and, 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 and reach unserved and underserved populations. And the question and the answer that we got back was that only if they come through the door, you know, so at that time, I don't know if it might by what, 10 or 15. You're right, that's exactly what they said. 10 they or 15. Said, we will turn no one down but they have to come to our door. We are not reaching out to anyone. Yeah, and that, and again, that was 10 or 15 years ago. And now, I, like I say, now everybody you, you know is doing outreach and diversity and inclusion and trainings on cultural linguistic and cultural competency and linguistics. And so that's why I said we've been doing this for uh, uh, trying to engage in this effort for the past 20 years. So, you know, it's nothing that uh, uh, we haven't been doing for a while. And we realized that, uh, you know, you can throw a rock into a group and hit f five or six people now that are doing diversity and inclusion and outreach or whatever it is you want to call it from specific agencies now. And so, but that's the, that was the response that we got then. So, um, so in essence, you know, um, these are the questions that one of our grantees come, came up with uh, years ago and uh, to help us, uh, you know, do our outreach effort with our grantees. And we have been using these questions ever since. So, and Ken, I think we have some resources on our website okay. that talks about how you, I know it was in one of your newsletters, so mm -hmm. I'm sure it's up there on how to approach the un and unserved and, and, uh, and all of that. And just as an aside from outreach, I just want to say this from the planner's point of view, if you do get awarded a grant, please note that you will become our partner. You're, you're, we're not the taskmaster whipping you and finding out your faults. If you have things that as you're going through that changes 
you talk to your staff about it and they'll talk to the committee and maybe even bring you in to talk about because we're partners. We don't want you to fail. But like Carolyn said, if something goes wrong, you didn't fail. We just figured out that we can't do it that way. And when you do come on board, there is a video grantee orientation where you get to take your time and go through the video of each one of us talking about our respective parts. And then the staff person for, that's assigned to you will follow up with you on, on uh, what you've learned in the videos and what questions you have. So just know we will not throw you in the pool of grantees and you're out there by yourself and then we're sitting on the sideline beating you to death and finding everything all the faults. We want to work with you to make this right because when you win, we win. And and we want to, I, I want to share something with you in a minute because we still take this as serious a, a, as we did from day one. And the reason why I know that outreach is still relevant to some agencies in some, um, you know, some government agencies, some private sector agencies, so on and so forth. I went on a, to a training that I was training about five years ago. And there was this age group that wanted to reach the, the black community in their, in, in, in their community. Uh, so one of the questions, when I knew that this was still re real and I knew that this was still needed, one of the last question of that training that I had been a part of for three, three days was, Ken, how do you approach black people? Now, I was caught very off guard, but one of the things that I had to do was to pull myself imme uh, immediately together because this was a gentleman who had a very serious question. So I had to take his question very seriously because he did not know how to approach a black person. It could have been an Asian, it could have been a Latino or, or, or whatever. But at that time, this particular agency was trying to reach the black community and he had had no contact with the black community not more than three or four, five years ago in this day and age. So, you know, I don't know how relevant that is. So I just had to answer his question by saying, you know, you approach them uh, first and foremost, like you approach them, anybody else. But because you're a government agency, you and you are trying to get them involved and trying to sell a service or trying to get them involved as advocates and so on and so forth, or maybe in your grant funding process. You have to be very truthful to people, not just black people, but you have to be very truthful to people and gain their trust, you know? And, and so, you know, he wanted to know what the approach was, what the strategy, what the strategy was to, you know, approach a certain population. So that told me then that outreach is, is still very much, uh, you know, relevant, you know, as, as you know, for me as much as three or four years ago, you know? So uh, there's, there's still work to be done to, to bring everybody again to the table to, to do this work. And we're hoping as grantees that you're able to, you know, help and, and, and be a part of uh, the outreach effort because the work continues, the work continues uh, as we speak. So, um, um, so welcome aboard. I hope we yeah. hope that uh, you get an opportunity to to be awarded one of the council grants. And um, if there are any more questions, Paul. There's yeah. a comment I'd like to make. I'm okay. looking at 4.9. Okay. And when the reason why that that question is critical as you do your work. If, if you award the grant is because we have to report that information to our funding source so they can know that we do have folks in the field actually doing the work and this is the disparity that there's coming up they're coming up with you know why because it may be something we need to fund in the next five years 
So it's critical that you, if you come into that kind of, of thing, uh, some kind of disparity, that you do take that 4.9 seriously so the staff can see it because that might be what the very issue we need to work on in our next five-year state plan. So I'm going to hush up. Um, I hope you've learned something. And I work part-time with Ken, and that's why I'm chiming in. So I hope you've learned something today because Leslie's up to do clear language and she does such a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Leslie Conley and I staff for um, the Leadership Development Committee and the Employment Committee. And we have a clear language subcommittee that falls under the Leadership Development Committee. Um, Paul, could you do the next slide? Um, Council is using the term clear language to describe how it's making its materials easy to read and understand. And we're asking that our audiences, including the members, staff, grantees, um, use the recommendations developed by Council for printed materials. Other organizations, including the federal government, are starting to use clear language, but they call it different names. And a lot of times you see plain language. Um, but the purpose is to make information easier to read and to be understood. Um, next slide. Clear language makes sure all readers understand information quickly and correctly. It's not overly simplified and does not talk down to readers. And readers concentrate on what a message says instead of trying to understand complicated words and writing. Um, I need to point out that it's not easy read. We're not talking easy read. It's the clear language is where you write to, to your audience. We do find it um, it's important for um, grantees to understand that your proposals that you're writing might be reviewed by individuals who have difficulties reading, difficulty reading, or might not read at all, and that your proposals might be read to them, and it might be read to them by somebody who doesn't understand actually the material they read, the, you know, they're not as familiar with it. So if you can write as clearly as possible and not use complicated words. Your proposals will not be scored on this part at all. Um, but remember, you're not writing a college dissertation and no poetry. Make the, um, it easy to understand. Amen, amen. Also, if you are writing a grant that is going to be targeting individuals who might be um, have read, reading difficulties, and you're going to be using print materials. You know, I'd encourage you to attach something to your proposal, maybe a previous work you've done, showing that you can write clearly to the audience that you're going to be writing to. Um, go on. Um, we have some recommendations for writing clearly. Uh, keep all the words and body copy easy to read and understand. Write with accurate, simple words. Choose words you think the audience will understand. Eliminate acronyms and jargon unless you define them. Eliminate extra words. It's amazing how many extra words we put in there. Um, and I know I do it. Use person first language. Write in conversational style as if you're talking to the person. Write in active voice. Use complete short sentences and paragraphs. Keep paragraphs to one main idea. <clears throat> Create clear headings and subheads to guide your reader throughout the document. Arrange paragraphs in a logical order. Don't use long words when a shorter word will do. And don't write more than you need. Um, next one, we have um, Lots of information on clear language. It can be found on our website. And we, the subcommittee developed a handbook. And we also have some templates that for minutes and some other things that council is using um, internally. Um, and it's on our website and the address is there. I know I talk very fast, but you know, I know everybody's hungry. So <laughs> uh, are there any questions?
There are none in the chat, but uh, that doesn't mean anybody can't uh, turn on their microphone and ask a question. I just, I just had a comment really. I just wanted to say thank you for um, kind of explaining that because I think that's one of the things that I struggle with whenever I'm writing is like, okay, am I being um, detailed enough? Am I being too de detailed? So thank you for um, clarity on that. Well, it, it's, I know it's difficult. It, I mean, myself, I have a difficult time and um, making sure I'm writing clearly. And I know I don't want people to think that they have to, um, that, like I said, they're getting scored on this part um, because I think it's a, it is a difficult thing to do. Um, but just be mindful that there's people with different reading abilities that are, could be reading your proposal. Right. Thank you. Now we do have a question. Is there a way to delete a request to join an organization? I pulled up the list. Okay, Paul, this is a your question. Uh, that's a great that's a great question. Uh, I don't know. Um, it, it would just be a matter of the organization denying your request. It's not it's not like uh, you know you only have so many requests, um, but what is the organization that you requested to join? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I haven't requested anything. I just noticed like I was just like had set it up kind of while you were going through instructions and um, I had scrolled, I was scrolling down for like Ohio and I saw like, there's like two different ones for Cincinnati Children's Medical Center. Oh, I yes. I was just thinking, and there was uh, multiple places that had like two names. So I thought, oh, well, I don't know if yeah. that's on purpose or by mistake or. Yeah, let me, give me a second. And I, cause, cause there have been instances where somebody like they they looked and they couldn't find their organization. So they decided to create a new organization and ultimately ended up creating a duplicate organization. Okay. Um, so uh, you're looking at Cincinnati Children's? Yeah, okay. I just had Googled Ohio, left all the other filters, didn't touch those and then just searched and I just noticed when I was scrolling down. Okay, so there are two versions there, um, let me... Or like even at the very top, there's like abilities in action. There's two of those. Um, uh, yeah, so one looks like it's not completed. Maybe the other one is more complete. So I'm like, how do you know? Yeah, I, I see that, uh, you know, the Cincinnati Children's Hospital um, has a most recent sign on of April 31st rather than Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Um, they have, they have a sign on uh, 2020. So Cincinnati Children's Hospital is the more uh, current organization. But is there a way for us to see if we're looking to, to if we wanna join a certain, cause what I see is there's three, actually there's, I see three children's, but oh, I can't see when their most recent sign on uh, th there is not, let me, which, what's the third one that you're seeing? Is it University of Cincinnati? No, it's Cincinnati Children's Hospital, then Cincinnati Children's Medical Center, and then Cincinnati Children's Medical Center. And the only thing different would be the phone numbers. So. Um, well, that, there's only two that I'm seeing, um, but, you know, that this is this is one of the downsides of DD Suite is that multiple people can create organizations, um, but the Cincinnati Children's Hospital with the five one three six three six forty two hundred um, appears to be the most current uh, organization in use. Okay. With the Mary Ellen Daston. Okay. 
and they could have, I mean, children's is so big. They could have maybe different departments doing different things. Cause I think the 4,200 is their DDBP, but yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, we, we're trying to get, get them all consolidated under a single organization uh, because it doesn't make sense to have multiple organizations yeah. because within that you can have multiple grants uh, yeah. and assign grant activities as I showed you before. Uh, so should we, if somebody, if somebody's looking for something and there's multiple names, should we just reach out and ask? Yep. Okay. Send me an email and I, I will investigate. I can look up uh, who's current, who's not. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, yeah, I have a question. This is Leslie B from Cleveland. Um, with regard to the three um, people that you have to require for each application, the project director, the finance person, and the organization director. So if I'm interpreting correctly, um, if we're going to go after something involving employment, um, our person on staff who works with our adults would be the project director. Is the treasurer for the board an acceptable person for the finance person? Sure, it's, uh, it's whoever you deem appropriate to have access to and work on that grant. So if you're having the treasurer, if you're expecting the treasurer to sort of um, take care of the expense reports and submit your periodic Thank expense you. report data and budget data, you definitely want to have them have access. Oh, it smells wonderful. Okay. Um, and then the organization director, and in the case of a nonprofit, that would be the ED, correct? Yes. Okay. So back to the finance organization. So I was trying to look for a place to put myself. So I'm the development director, but I'm also the one who files the grants, provides any kind of, you know, updates, whatnot. So I could put myself as the finance director, even though I technically have nothing to do with finances. <laughs> sure. I, I think there, uh, there's, there's an additional uh, classification of project staff. Uh, you, you can, you can put anything there. You just at a minimum have to have those three, okay. um, those three folks. And the project staff person, you can set up for whatever emails you want them to get as well. Correct. Okay. So really the three main people should be three people that are technically working on this grant at any given time or would need to access it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got a direct question in the chat about and, and any one of the DD council staff may want to answer this. Do you suggest including a copy of print material we might use for a program eventually? For example, if you're looking at uh, the transportation grant, should we attach a flyer we might use for the program? Um, it, you know, it doesn't hurt uh, because that's what the review panel is going to um, look at. I don't know that. Uh, it, Ultimately, that's not scored in terms of the grant application, but it certainly helps provide uh, more information to the review panel. Leslie, do you have something to add? No, I agree with you. It just it just provides information that you've done something before. It it never hurts to show that you have experience. You know, Gary in his presentation had um, recommended that people read the read carefully the notice of funds available. And I want to clarify that within the DD suite, we have what's called a notice of funds available that you're submitting your application for. However, on our website is what's called the official notice of funds available that lists all of the different projects. Um, but it also includes the score sheet that the review panel will be um, using to evaluate your applications. So. Um, it's always helpful to know how you're going to be, how, how your application is going to be evaluated or scored. Um, so that is contained within the official notice of funds available on our website, along with other very uh, useful and valuable information as you're preparing your application. So I think if there are no more questions, uh, I think our plan was to, to not um, rush into the grant, uh, the, the specific uh, committee presentations. So we're going to go into uh, a break or standby. This, um, this 
uh, Zoom link will be open and active the entire time. Uh, but I think we will plan to reconvene at 145 with the- That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, and so uh, we're here, but uh, you're welcome to, to leave and come back or stay on. It's up to you. But this, this channel will be live and active. Thank you, everybody.
Could I give it a few minutes or should I go ahead and get started? Well, it depends on whether you need all the time or uh, if, you, if you'll have time at the end, but um, probably wouldn't hurt to give people a minute or two. That's fine. Just to let you guys know, the ODOT decided to do um, road work outside my house today. So if you hear lots of strange noises, that's what that is. <laughs> I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the Children and Health Committee uh, uh, grant section. This is my first time doing this, so bear with me. Please feel free to ask any questions that um, you might have. I'll go through each of the grants that Children and Health Committee um, it, it has. I'll tell a little bit about the intent of the grant and um, some other things, and then open that up for questions. Um, next screen. So we have our Come Together grant. Um, basically, this grant is to um, increase collaboration between family advocacy organizations. Um, the committee recognized that there are lots of uh, family uh, organizations out there um, that um, it would be really good if they could work together to have a stronger voice to advocate on behalf of families. Um, it would be really good if they could have a, uh, a some sort of way that um, each program uh, has similar language or protocols so that if you move from one family organization to another that uh, you have uh, um, kind of basic language to use. Um, so that's what that um, grant is about, trying to make sure that we can have a strong family um, advocacy voice out there. Next slide. Um, there's the Inclusive Recreation Grant. So um, the committee recognized that uh, there are lots of uh, recreational opportunities um, in the community available. 
to folks, um, but a lot of times those um, have activities aren't accessible or inclusive for people with disabilities. So we're not interested in recreating some sort of special uh, program. We're interested in making sure that um, the activities that are out there are available and inclusive to uh, people with disabilities. Next slide. And the last grant is about special education. Um, one of the things that uh, we discussed in great detail in our committee is that um, families struggle um, with the special education process. Um, going to IEP meetings is difficult. It's stressful. Um, so we want to try to provide um, a way to increase uh, families' knowledge of the special education process so they feel more comfortable with that and um, make sure that we increase the number of, um, of people that are helping families advocate for themselves during that special education process. Uh, next slide. So when you're writing your grants, some of the things that are important uh, to make sure that um, uh, people are included would that you would want to make sure that you used varied communication methods and materials. So when you're writing your grants, think about these things, making sure that um, whatever your when you're writing these things to make sure that access to resources supports, events, um, are anticipating needs of people with disabilities. Um, make sure that you recognize the perspectives of people with developmental disabilities and their families and assure that we are addressing cultural and linguistic differences when you're uh, planning activities within your grants. Okay, so I think that's it for mine. Uh, what questions do you have? Anyone? Um, I do have um, some reference materials for uh, folks that I can put in the chat um, just um, about the uh, different grants that I kind of looked up. Um, I can put those in the chat. I also have an article if you're interested in reading it about um, special education advocacy for families. If you are interested in that, um, you can send me an email. You know, I didn't put my um, email. Uh, let me do that. Hey, Rebecca, it's Paul. Um, uh, I do have, Leslie B has a question. Leslie B, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Sure. Um, just getting back to the um, empowering families um, specific description that's listed in the notice of funds available. Mm -hmm. um, so you do list IEP meetings um, specifically, and you also list that there's 250,000 students with disabilities in Ohio. Right. Um, are you looking for something that can hopefully partner up the whole state to serve all 250,000 students? Or can you know a nonprofit kind of look to their area and partnering with what's local to them, knowing that they can't necessarily reach all 250,000? I think that we're we're not going to be able to reach all 250,000. Um, I know that, um, so currently there are some um, advocacy programs that focus on um, particular areas of the state. I know that DRO has some um, special advocates, but they're only, um, because of funding, can only concentrate on a certain area. So I think that um, we, we would be interested in 
just expanding whatever access is currently out there. Right. And then as far as um, I know that there are some school districts that provide, um, you know, parent mentors. Is that something that could be considered as part of a collaboration with this type of initiative or um, are you looking, you know, more for collaborations with specific people that are trained as IEP advocates? I think that would be up to you how you would want to write that grant. So collaboration is good. Okay, thank you. You can work on um, collaborating now and then potentially expanding for the future is always a positive. And remember what I, this is the ticket is, remember what I said in the, in the bigger plenary. Council looks favorably upon uh, projects that do a lot of collaboration, leveraging of dollars, and kind of thinking about how they would sustain themselves if council's funding were to end in five years. Going back to your first question, uh, uh, since this is Rebecca's first time, she did a very good job. What I would add to it is one of the things council looks for when you're first starting off is to see how you do work it in your region or your area. And as you work it to your advantage, if at some point um, we can see that you, you've done such a good job that it can be replicated, then that might be something council will think about later, replicating your, having you replicated in other areas of the state. But at the beginning, what I know from my history on council, we do let you focus in on, unless you say you're going to do the whole state, we let you focus in on what's nearest to you. I hope that I helped answer your question as well. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Patika. Rebecca, there was another question in the chat from the Autism Society of Greater Akron, and it says, could you expand on not interested in expanding specific programs to people with DD? You, you, you there you go. You have muted. <laughs> I'm always doing that. <laughs> so, um, I think what I'm trying to say when it's not specific programs, we would, we do not want you to create a new program. Um, we would like for you to take already available opportunities within the community and make sure that they are accessible and inclusive to people with disabilities. Any other questions? She can't be that good. This is her first time. Ask her questions, y'all. Get her flustered. Make her cry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's okay. Crying, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I'll put uh, one more link in there. Um, the last one for inclusive recreation is just some information that I got from um, other, other DD councils. Uh, these were on the CDC website that just were talking about how to make uh, uh, activities more inclusive. So I'll put those links up there. And again, I have an article, if you're interested, please send me an email and I will email that to you so you can understand more about um, the empowering families things. Uh, Tima, I don't know if the, I, I, I would imagine that we can ask Kim, our electronic design specialist to place this PowerPoint on our website. I can tell you that we are recording. Um, and so the, the, this recording and we are holding another Bitters Conference next Wednesday. Um, we plan to record that as well. Uh, both of them will be posted to our website. So uh, you can refer back to these conversations. You can refer back to the, uh, the full session. If you said, I thought, you know, this person said something on this topic, maybe I can check with that. And, Quite honestly, um, you know, I've been with I've been working for the DD Council for 
over 15 years now, the staff is readily accessible. Um, if you ever have a question, just reach out. Um, they're going to help in any way that they can. Does that answer your question? Well, sort of. Perfect. Well, this is the time we have set aside for the Children and Health Committee. Um, so we'll, we'll be holding this open for the next 15 minutes um, in case anybody does have questions. Um, I think we've decided internally that we were not going to rush the schedule because there are folks that, um, you know, I'm next, the public policy projects are slated to start at 2.20 and we don't want to start, um, we want to allow people that had planned to just come in for that breakout session to come in when the time is scheduled. So you still have 15 minutes to, uh, to pepper Rebecca with questions. Um, as, and I'm kind of on fatigue side. We, we got to make her cry. Yay! This is too easy for her. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about just the overall process, stuff we talked about earlier today that you might want to ask? Paul and I are both here, and we kind of have a handle on everything. Uh, anybody got any additional questions that has nothing to do with children and health? Um, I just had a general question, uh, just in general. So how come some of the funds are a single project and some are multiple projects? Just curious. Oh, I, well, I see Fatika. You're just going to stay quiet on that one. <laughs> well, well, actually, mo there's only one that's a kind of single. Everyone else is multiple, and that's why. Oh. And even the one that's single is still. It has to be competitively bid. You know, because someone still might up them, you know, so I'm not, th there's one that is a continuation, but that's because they went through the process before and their project happens to go into the next five years. Oh, so okay. I'm, we only have one that's a continuation and that's in my committee. The rest of them are competitive and it's, it's, it's multiple, it's not single. Anybody can apply for them. So maybe I'm, I'm not getting your question. Right. I'm not hearing it correctly. Well, it's just when I was reading the descriptions for some of them, it says, um, I, that's how I interpreted it. So when it says the ODD will fund a project to increase and improve, I interpreted that as you're only looking for one award winner. No, well, they, what's, what she's saying or what they're saying, at the end of the day, only one project will be selected. Right. That's what that, right. So that's what they're saying, is at the end of the day, we might get 50 projects in for a particular application and for one project, only one of them will select be selected. Okay, right. So that's, that's what, what I was, means. so basically they're all one single project will be selected for each category. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and uh, as hold on. Say, hold, say, on. Paul? Oh, hold on, there, so, so within each particular project, within the plan language of each project, there may be, and I, I don't know all of the projects, I know my projects, so I don't want to speak for other ones. But for example, in the current, um, current five-year plan, we had some self-advocacy grants that were awarded. So there, so there was a, a, a one plan piece and it had a True. pot of funds that True. were divided up into uh, three different grants. And True. So that, the reason that is, is that the committee has decided um, when they've created the plan language that they did not want to put all of their eggs in one basket. They wanted three different entities to sort of uh, attack the, the, at that leadership development project. So there are instances, or there may be instances in this five-year cycle 
um, where you have a, a plan language and the intent is to award more than one, um, one agency or one grant. Yeah, right. and, that, and that's because that leadership grant has three focuses according to the DD Act. And so she was trying to put it out there so whoever apply or the people apply could see the three areas and everybody pick one of those areas that you're going to focus in on and then they'll pick the one, the best one out of each one of those areas. So, so hers was a, Paul's right, hers was a little differently written. It's one pot of money that's going to be split up among a number of them, but it's based on three specific areas that the DD Acts wants the leadership to focus on. Got it. Thank you. Uh, nine minutes to, to get Rebecca. <laughs> So is this your slide, Rebecca? Did you want to explain this slide? She's already done them. Oh, she already did it? I did all of them. I, I went through them very quickly, I guess. I, okay. I thought I might have more questions. So, okay. okay. Well, while we've got some time to kill, um, for, for those of you who may be applying for your, for your first grant, um, and, and I was going to cover this during my, my brief uh, stint, is that uh, our grant review panels, um, and they are spelled out also in, uh, in that booklet that I mentioned in the main set session. Our grant review panels are comprised of uh, three council members and two external reviewers. So what we've done is uh, as we've developed the plan language, the, the program staff have looked at the, the subject matter and went out and found subject matter experts. And so when you submit your application and it gets reviewed by the review panel, um, that will be consist of five folks, uh, three council members and two external reviewers who do not have a conflict of interest. Uh, so it, you, know, you couldn't have a, you know, a staff person in your office um, can't be on the grant review panel because that would be a conflict of interest or a board member um, from your organization. Um, and so, uh, the grant reviews are scheduled for August, um, and I think each of the competitive reviews we've scheduled about 90 minutes for the review panels. Um, so, for example, um, yeah, let's see what this is. This, this things to consider grant. Rebecca has formed a review panel of three council members and two external reviewers. And if we get multiple applications, if she gets multiple applications. They're going to go through all of the applications in that 90 minute time span um, in August. Um, and then they'll, they'll hopefully select a, a winner and notify the, the awarded applicant. And then if there are any conditions, we usually use the month of August and September to clean up that uh, any outstanding issues. Fatika, do you want to add anything else to the yeah, process that we're killing time? Yeah, what they'll do too is they'll look at the applications that have the two highest score and then and then they'll go from there. The ones that have the real, real low scores, they will end up moving them out. And then they'll just they'll just talk about the two with the highest scores because there has been times when the one with the second highest score end up getting uh, the, 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 the uh, award because after they got through talking, they saw greater aspects in the second one than they did in the first one. And so even though the score was higher, th they went back and changed their score because they liked the conversation. So even though it will appear in most cases, the one with the highest score will get selected. I have been in grant reviews where the one with the second highest score was selected, but the but the scores was changed to reflect that after consideration and the debating that goes back and forth. And trust me, there's debating that goes back and forth. They come to a common understanding and they kind of like the second one better and that's the one that gets it and they'll change the score. And then like Paul said, there'll be some conditions that come with it. I haven't been in one where there wasn't any recommendations but um, but they're very light. I have been in one where they almost had, they liked it, but they made them almost rewrite the whole darn thing. 
you know, that, that was ridiculous, but they really liked the basic threads of what they wrote. But when we did the condition letter, it was almost like a major rewrite. And at the end, they once they did the rewrite, they, they were they were everybody was satisfied. So it's it's an interesting process. It's a fair process, in my opinion. And your your everybody's application will get the weighted attention that is due. Well, it looks like you're off the hook, Rebecca. Yes, she is for a first time. They were supposed to ask her questions up to the very last possible moment. She's getting off too easy, Paul, and I will remember this. <laughs> I remember my first one. I was sweating bullets uh, back in uh, 1988. I mean, I was sweating bullets. Oh my goodness, well, that's good. Sorry, I do have one more question for Rebecca. Good. Help yourself. <laughs> for the um, three letters of recommendation, is it helpful to have those recommendation letters be applicable? I was, I have no idea. But, <laughs> oh, okay. that's a bad but I would question. Say so. <laughs> All the recommendations that I've seen has to do with the people are saying they will vouch for the work you're going to do and that the issue is important and that they're there to support you in any way they can. It's usually not off cuff stuff. It has to relate to what you are applying for. All the recommendation that letters I've done to help people is always on the subject matter. What is it they're getting ready to work on that people want to recommend and say, yes, these are a good candidate. They, they can do the job. I know what they can do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have anything else to add, Paul? Yes. <laughs> You're, you cracked me up particularly. Like, Paul can answer this, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, what I will tell you is, and I said this in the main session, is we, in the, in the official notice of funds available, we lay out what the scoring is for each, for each question response, okay? And uh, there isn't scoring for letters of recommendation or attachments. However, uh, I can tell you that the review panels, when they're evaluating the qualifications, the number two question, um, they do review and they have talked about the letters of recommendation that an organization yep. has received in that qualification section. So yep. that's where your letters of recommendation are going to probably be applicable to the value of, uh, applied to the qualifications question. Yes, I agree. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right. Well, uh, we have a we've scheduled a five minute break before we'll start public policy. Um, so we'll just be in standby here. Good job, Rebecca.
All right, I show that it is uh, 220 and so that's uh, the time we've allotted to talk about the public policy committee grants uh, for that are up for competitive bid. Uh, this this uh, summer, we are only accepting applications on two uh, public policy committee grants. We'll, we'll actually have two more next year that are not included in this presentation, uh, but we're staggering the release of some of our grants. Um, and I'll just quickly tell you, uh, for next year, uh, we will have some funding available for our uh, public policy research grants. So that's a continuation of some projects we've been um, intermittently doing uh, through the Public Policy Committee in this five-year cycle um, they, to do some uh, public policy research related to, uh, for example, we had a waiting list study. We've had a study on the Medicaid buy-in for workers with disabilities. Um, and those types of uh, projects have contributed to actual public policy change. Um, and then we have another uh, grant that will be released next year called the uh, Federal Legislative Advocacy Partnership, um, the FLAP. And uh, that is to plan and coordinate a conference actually in Washington, DC, um, and to help support uh, individuals with disabilities and family members to participate in the, uh, in the federal policy arena in terms of uh, learning and then advocating um, with uh, congressional offices. The ones that we are seeking for today are the DD Awareness and Advocacy Day, the Developmental Disabilities Awareness and Advocacy Day. Um, that's a $35,000 grant. Um, it is a continuation of a project that council has done now for a couple of five-year cycles. Um, it is a single uh, planned event at the Ohio State House. Now, it, the project has evolved over time. Uh, it was originally called the Legislative Advocacy Day Coordinator. And so um, it was a State House Day where people just met with their legislators. And it has since been merged with the Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month kickoff event. So now it's awareness and advocacy uh, merged into a single event. Um, and generally, um, you know, whoever is the recipient of the grant, the expectation is that uh, you will collaborate and work with a number of organizations, including the Department of Developmental Disabilities, uh, the county board. So, you know, it could be, any of those entities could be the recipient of the grant. The expectation is, is that everyone will work together towards um, accomplishing the goals of the project. Um, the biggest pieces of this, of, of this uh, project are planning and logistics, okay? So um, historically what the uh, project has done is it has developed a planning committee um, comprised of uh, the, those collaborative organizations along with people with developmental disabilities. Um, and they have taken on the uh, responsibility of planning a program, an out one hour program with speakers that present at the Ohio State House. And then the logistics piece, which is scheduling legislative meetings for people, um, handling the registration, uh, pre-event pre registration and um, day of registration. Um, there's a lot of logistics that are involved in this project. I have, I've often had people say, wow, 35,000 for a single day. Um, when you look at the logistics involved with planning this, um, particularly for people with developmental disabilities um, and the unique needs that they have, um, it's, it's a, a lot of work. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about this is the Public Policy Committee continues this project um, because it, it uh, brings a lot of awareness to uh, the DD issue. Um, we've heard legislators um, say at different events, wow, that day that they have where people with disabilities come to the state house is very important. Um, we, we take notice. Um, um, so it is a, a high image event. Um, and so the expectation by the council um, will remain um, that it be a high, high profile, uh, very well received event. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, you're planning a, a day, you're planning uh, 
you, you know, you work with me, the, the council staff person, um, we do some stuff like we're able to um, schedule the state house because we're a state agency. So we take care of some of that stuff. Uh, we are partners in, in this process. So, um, you know, if you're applying and you haven't received this before, uh, you know, we'll work together to uh, achieve the objectives. So that's the, the first grant that we're seeking funds for. It's a $35,000 grant. Um, and then they are, the, um, whatever that 35 divided by three, there is some matching there. Um, I can tell you that uh, the match generated by the people participating in the event um, far exceeds the minimum 25%. So that's the first part. Um, the second grant that we are looking at in the public policy committee. So this is a continuation of a new project. So we're currently in this current five-year plan, we're trying a new approach called the General Assembly Briefing Sessions, the GAB Sessions. And um, it's a unique project uh, in terms of what councils are doing across the country. We actually presented to our National Association uh, two years ago on this project as a demonstration of a new approach. Um, and these are lunchtime, lunchtime educational sessions. Um, I think the plan language uh, kind of describes that there is a high rate of turnover among uh, legislative staff and legislators. And what we found is when we ask uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to do some advocacy work, to speak out on their own behalf, oftentimes they're talking to legislators and staff that don't even have a basic understanding of how our system uh, operates, how it's uh, financed, um, how it works. Uh, so, you know, we would have folks uh, go in and talk about their job at the workshop. And uh, you can quite honestly tell that uh, the, the staff fresh out of college didn't know what a workshop was. So the GAP sessions were designed to be sort of a training session for legislators and staff um, for them to get a better understanding of how our system operates and what are key issues within our system. So they're educational sessions. They have featured, um, in every session, they've featured either a self-advocate or a parent along with professionals. Um, so typically there's been a, uh, just to give you an idea, there's been a DD 101. So a breakdown of how Ohio's uh, system is structured. We have a state Department. We have county boards of DD, which are rather unique when you look across the country. Um, and you have a, a provider system really set up to, to serve people. And so we've been able to kind of lay out, okay, this is how our system is structured. And then we've had a session on what, what is a home and community-based service waiver. We've had sessions on um, what are the different employment profiles for people with DD, uh, you know, you have the workshop, you have supported employment, you have employment first. Um, so we've had uh, a number of things that uh, the current grantee and, the, and me, the council staff, we work together to sort of uh, identify what those uh, topic matters could be, um, and then developed a program around that, and then planned it, um, did outreach with the legislative offices, uh, planned a lunch, um, and it's usually an hour, it's very well received. Um, we've gotten very good comments and feedback from the legislators and staff. And what we found is over, if you're familiar with the General Assembly, uh, there is a new General Assembly every two years. And uh, at the end of that two years, uh, there's typically some turnover due to term limits. Um, and there's also turnover of legislative staff. And so what we found is every two years, we generally would go back to that DD 101 um, and then identify a couple of other uh, sessions to occur over the, uh, over the General Assembly. But that's, uh, those are the two public policy project grants. Oh, the other key piece um, for the GAP session is it is whoever's applying, it's very important for them to understand that there is no lobbying, no advocacy actually occurring in these sessions. These are informational, um, uh, informational sessions only. So uh, while the state budget is currently um, being considered at the state house, if we were to have a session, we wouldn't be talking about legislation or the budget. It would be talking about uh, 
per, perhaps an issue that might be contained in the in the in the budget, but not uh, no specific ask, no advocacy associated with um, with that. So with that, those are the two public policy projects. Covered them in ten minutes, so I got another twenty to answer questions. Happy to answer any questions folks might have. He's not that good either. Somebody asked him a question, please. All right, piece of cake. Uh, Mr. Danlinger, are you available? Yes, Paul, I am. Uh, well, you know, since we're, we have some time to kill, I just wanted to introduce to the folks uh, who are participating in my session. Um, the council chair has joined us uh, for the afternoon sessions here. Michael, did you want to say anything? Do you have any comments you want to? I'm putting you on the spot. I know you didn't know I was going to do that, but um, well, I just want I just want to welcome everyone here. I hope everyone is enjoying hearing our wonderful staff present to you what we're what we're looking at as far as what we want to receive for grants, and we hope that we provide you with information that is helpful and. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. And if you have any questions for me, you can feel free to ask. Paul, I hope that was what you were looking for. Perfect. I didn't want to let the opportunity go by. Uh, uh, there was, I think, a mix up of whether you were uh, speaking today. So we might as well throw you uh, <clears throat> to the lambs there, the, the wolves. Oh, no, that's fine. I wouldn't expect anything less. Michael Dinger is the the uh, chairperson of our council, newly appointed chairperson. So he's here just kind of representing council and uh, supporting staff today. And I appreciate that, Michael. Not a problem, Fazika. I'm happy to be here and support all the staff. Michael will also be on these some of these grant reviews, so everybody behave yourselves. <laughs> She's right, because I will be watching. <laughs> and so will Fatika. She keeps us all in line. Right. <laughs> so far, staff have actually been answering people's questions and uh, or being thorough in their presentation, that everybody appears to be speechless, Michael. They do, which is a good sign because that means they must love what everybody's saying. I guess that's true. Or they're gonna write, write us a bad report. They didn't understand anything we said. <laughs> but I know somebody's gotta have some questions for Paul because Paul is just not that good. I know, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I know we're recording this. This is how much fun we're having. <laughs> you know, we got to give you the business too, Paul. Uh, hey, uh, the better you give it to me, the better I will give it back. So, uh, uh, do your worst. Oh, I look forward <laughs> to it. <laughs> so yeah, though, those are, as I mentioned, uh, if you're just joining, uh, the, the Public Policy uh, Committee has a number of grants. Uh, we are only offering two this grant cycle. Uh, we'll have two being offered uh, next year. Um, and then we, the committee did, um, did create a fifth grant um, 
uh, and I'll share this just as by, by way of um, information because I have some time. Um, our fifth grant is not being offered for competitive review. The, the committee felt that there was only one entity able to, uh, to conduct this, this task. And we're calling this the value of people with disabilities grant. Um, and it's, it's an expansion of a current program that Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities has um, called the Vocational Apprenticeship Program. Um, and that program is designed to increase the employment of people with disabilities in state government. Um, and in essence, it's the result of Governor DeWine's executive order calling for the employment of more people with uh, disabilities. And what the council has decided is that while the governor's executive order is great and it applies to executive level agencies, there is nothing that um, would promote employment of people with disabilities in the legislative branch of government. And so uh, the committee believes that having people with disabilities working in the legislative branch of government, so the House and the Senate or the Legislative Service Commission and some of the ancillary other legislative agencies um, would provide additional exposure to policymakers um, and exposure to people with disabilities to those types of networks. Um, having worked in the legislature myself, uh, you do develop a network. Everybody develops a network in, in the job that they have. Um, and it's just, quite frankly, people with disabilities are not having equal access to that legislative network that uh, other people are. So the value of people with disabilities grant um, uh, will provide uh, funds to OOD to expand their vocational apprenticeship program to target employment of people with disabilities and particularly people with DD in the legislative branch of government. So that's our that's the public policy's fifth project. Um, and again, we have the FLAP, which is the Federal Legislative Advocacy Partnership that would be awarded every other year. Um, and the, re the reason we're doing that is that uh, we decided to do the, the, the project in the fall. Um, annually, there's a disability policy seminar that occurs in the spring. Um, and we decided we wanted to do our, an Ohio-focused federal advocacy approach in the fall. And if you're doing the fall, you do not wanna do the fall of an election year because the Congress is just not around. They're out campaigning. So the FLAP would be an every other year grant and that'll be offered next year. And then the research project will be offered every other year. And we're doing that so that we have enough funds to actually uh, provide to, to fund a research grant. So we don't have enough funds in the committee to do that every year. So we kind of save up our, uh, some leftover money and do those research projects. So that's the public policy committee's approach for the next uh, five-year cycle, but right now we, we uh, every year we do plan to have the DD Awareness and Advocacy Day. Um, I think that's the the prime event that everybody looks forward to. I can tell you uh, around November, December, people start asking what's going on, where can I register, when does who, who's who's talking, um, things like that, and then uh, the gab sessions. We are now getting folks saying, can can I do a session in your gab session? Uh, so we have um, uh, entities saying, wow, this is a really neat opportunity to gain exposure to our particular issue. Can you plan a session around our issue? And we work with them in the grantee. Um, the, the gap session has, has created a great opportunity for an entity that is into developing legislative relationships. Um, so, you know, their exposure, they're gaining exposure with those legislative offices um, while we're gaining exposure as the council as um, as a uh, as a reliable voice on policy issues. So those that's the the dual value there for the gap session. So hopefully I've given somebody enough to ask a question about. I will say this that the the last grantee who did the Advocacy Awareness Day, 
did a phenomenal job in the middle of the pandemic and they they made it virtual and they've done a little virtual all along but this time it was really virtual and it was phenomenal i i can't imagine what they went through with the logistics and the planning of it and having the governor speak and all that and i was able to as a person that has a, a constant chronic illness i was able to of course i work from home right now to sit in my warm home and i actually had a front seat as I watch this thing play out and watch every speaker and, and all the tech ambassadors talk, it was absolutely, in my opinion, uh, it was phenomenal, just phenomenal, considering you can't always rely on technology, but it worked for them this time. Again, they've done a little piece of technology all the time because they've had it on that, that, that legislative channel but to do the whole thing virtual was amazing to me. And they did, a, it, it went seamless and it was absolutely, I can't imagine how much work and time and effort went to make that happen, but it was very, very, very good. Well, I've got nine more minutes if anybody has questions. Uh, otherwise, we'll just hang tight for the next presenter, which is the uh, Employment and Leadership Development Grants. Um, and that'll be at 2.55. So I'm here if you have questions. If not, we will reconvene at 2.55. Well, good job, Paul. Good job. Well, I guess you did do a good job, Paul. The fact that no one has any questions to grow you with means that you must have done something right. He's able to keep his job another day. <laughs> you know, you don't have to act so surprised, Michael, that I did a good job. <laughs> well, I just want to make sure I show you the love. OK, thank you. You're welcome.
Uh, before we move on, for those folks that are still around for my uh, for my two projects, um, be, due to the funding amount, I, I, for, I neglected to mention uh, there are thirty five thousand uh, per grant, um, which would pay put you on a uh, biannual reporting schedule. So, uh, you know, you would only need to report uh, once every six months on your activities. So, uh, and that's that schedule is in our booklet that I pointed out, pointed to folks that's attached to every NOFA as well. Uh, but yeah, once every six months because the funding amount is less than $50,000.
Okay. Are we ready to start? Ready when you are, Leslie. Okay. Um, I'm Leslie Conley and I'm the chair of the employment, or not chair, shoot, I'm staff. <laughs> Sorry, staff of employment and leadership development um, committees. Um, Paul, could you go to the next slide? Um, this might get a tad confusing, so I'm gonna try to do um, 15 minutes on each if we have many questions. Otherwise, I'll just go through them. Um, we have employment committee grants and then we have the leadership development and we have two in each committee. And I have a grant in each of them that's a little different um, in terms of funding compared to most of the grants that we give out. Um, the first one is not difficult. It's very typical. Um, and it's uh, dollars and cents and it deals with financial literacy. Um, and council um, uh, will fund a project that develops and uses a plan so that people with disabilities have financial knowledge and support they need to manage their finances. Could you go to the next slide? And it's for 50,000. And financial literacy can include a lot of things. I think in disability, a lot of times we think about it being social security, uh, you know, SSDI, SSI, but it's more that we're looking at it more than that, you know, how to um, balance your checkbook, how to save money, credit cards, loans, um, and, and then how does all those things affect your benefits and how do you maintain that? I think it's difficult sometimes for families and people with disabilities who um, they've got an added step that a lot of us don't have to um, worry about. And, you know, as we've been working on this um, in the state for a long time, but how often do we still hear that people aren't going to work because they're afraid of losing their benefits? So that's always um, an issue. So, you know, we're hoping to develop um, a strategy to improve this and work on the strategies that are already being used in the state because there are some things going on. Um, could we go to the next slide, Paul? The other grant is the Employment Resource Grant, and we'll fund um, several projects with this that will increase the knowledge of and access to employment-related resources, technology, and programs for individuals with disabilities, family members, and service providers. This year, there's $50,000 there. This funding will change during there. That doesn't mean the grantee will get more. If you could go to the next slide, Paul. Okay, like I said, we'll fund several projects. This year, somebody can ask for between 10 and 50,000, and they need to say how many years they want the funding for. So somebody could request one year of funding for 50,000, or two years of funding for 30, or five years for 50. And again, it's kind of wide open. It's just you know, those increase the knowledge of employment related resources, technology and programs. So it's very open to anything in employment. I, I do need to remind people of things that you can't fund, but we, we can't and it, it'll be in the, um, the booklet that uh, for applying, but we're not gonna apply, um, we're not going to fund services. So if you're thinking about opening up a day hab and you want DD Council funding to fund, we're, we probably won't fund that. Um, so I just wanna put that out there. Remember what DD Council is supposed to be funding. Um, could you go to the next slide? Also in the plan language, the funding, the match requirements and the outputs are for all the combined proposals. So it's not just for one. Of course, if you're asking for $50,000, um, your match requirement is what it should be for $50,000. But if you're asking for thirty, dollars figure it out for $30,000. Um, this gets a little confusing. So in 2024, there'll be additional funding put into this grant. So the world, there could potentially be a, another competitive bid next year the following year, actually every year. Um, it, this doesn't mean that the grantees that are getting funding currently 
will get additional funding or, or get it, not currently, get selected this year, their funding will go up. The only way they'll be funding next year is if we get somebody asking for one year of funding. I know that might be confusing. So are there any questions on the grants in employment? I go, I talk fast. Can you repeat what you just said to make sure I understand <laughs> that clearly? <laughs> I know, I, I knew it was going to be, it's a little confusing. Okay, because the employment committee, I'm going to explain why the, the funding is different every year. The employment committee has some grants that will be ending in their off cycle. Um, we we want to use every dollar and we want to make sure that we're um, spreading out our resources um, in the area. So for in this pot of money for 22 and 23, we have $50,000. For 24, we have $89,000. And for 25 and 26, we have 134. So let's say this year we end up funding a grant for $25,000 for one year and $25,000 for two years. So that means in 23, we would have $25,000 available. And then I get, if, if that was just a one-year grant and a two-year grant in 24, we would have additional money, um, you know, depending on if we had a two-year grant and how long the grant we funded in 23 would be for. I, I, I'm hoping I'm explaining that well. I understand. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it looks yes. kind of funny. <laughs> Um, it, it's all good because if you don't get selected this year, you could get selected in a in um, future years, and you should come back and um, check and see um, when the funding becomes available. So that that's actually good news, um, and it, there's a lot of flexibility. But I want to remind everybody: put down how much money funding you want for each year and how many years. And it has to be between 10 and 50. Are there any other questions on the grants and employment? So Leslie, if you mm -hmm. get for year one, for right now, for 2022, if you got 10 proposals and everybody asked for $5,000, are you saying they would all be funded? No, because you have to ask between ten and fifty thousand. Oh, <laughs> okay, do the math. Um, ten. If if five agencies asked for ten thousand dollars for this year mm -hmm. and they all got funded, that would mean all the money for twenty twenty two has been allocated, and right. there would be zero money allocated for twenty twenty three. But then the grant cycle would open again in twenty twenty four when additional money is made into this grant. Yes, as long as all of them asked for grants that would extend past the one year mark. Because if somebody just asked for 10,000 for one year, but the rest of them asked for 10,000 for five years, then there would be 10,000 available in 23. Right, thank you. There any other questions? I'm excited to see the cre creativity with this. Okay, we can go to the next one. Next one's in leadership development and it's looking at youth with disabilities and advocacy skills. And we would like to fund a project that will increase and improve support children and youth with DD receive from families, schools, direct service providers, and other entities to learn advocacy and leadership skills, increase and increase and improve the opportunities children and youth with DD have to use advocacy skills in educational planning and all decision making and increase and improve the advocacy and leadership skills of children and youth with DD for them to speak on their be own behalf. And the grant is for 85,000. Could you go to the next slide? 
And here are the key activities. And I'm not going to read them because they sound very much like what I just read. Um, but I'm going to point out the last one. And this was put in um, or requested from the Task Force for Advocacy. And um, it's that the grantee will review and evaluate the project funded by the Virginia Department of Education, which focuses on providing direct instruction, models, and opportunities to practice skills associated with self-determined behavior. The grantee will make a recommendation to DD Council on whether such a project should be re replicated in Ohio's education system. This is just a review and evaluate. It's not you have to implement. Um, but we had a recommendation and we did put it in. It came through um, public comments. Um, next one. And this is another one that's kind of weird with the funding. It's empowering people with disabilities. Um, the DD Act requires that the Ohio DD Council um, work on three areas in the area of advocacy. We have to support a statewide uh, self-advocacy organization led by individuals uh, with developmental disabilities. Support does not mean fund. Support is could be given in a number of ways. Support leaders with developmental disabilities to give leadership training to future leaders with developmental disabilities. And support and expand individuals with developmental disabilities to participate in cross-disability and culturally diverse leadership. Um, the full amount is $70,000. Could you go to the next slide, please? We will fund several projects. You can um, ask for funding between the amounts of ten dollars and $35,000. You must clearly state which of the three areas that were in the previous slide um, you will be addressing. If you don't address one of those three areas, you will not be considered for funding. So you have to address one of the three areas that council has to work on. Uh, actually, we have to address all three. So please state which of those areas you're going to be working on and the amount of funding for each year. It's important to remember that the plan language shows overall match. Obviously, if you're putting in a grant for 10,000, you need to um, change the match. It won't be what's shown in the plan language. The outputs are for overall and um, obviously the funding. So are there any questions on the leadership development grants? Leslie, this is Shannon Moniak over at Services for Independent Living. The question I have, I guess for maybe both of them, regarding the youth one, it just says children and youth. Is there a specific age that is defined for youth regarding these grants? And then I guess my question then is the part A, B, for the empowering people with disabilities, is that limited to just adults? Can it be? I mean, could it go as young as like 19 up till a certain age? We, um, okay, so for the first one, we never really defined it. I think we were typically thinking school age. So, you know, it would be 21 and under um, when we were envisioning and when we talked about it in the committee, but it wasn't defined any further than that. Um, for the other one, there's never been any kind of age requirement for that. So I, you know, teens, I think that would be, uh, I know that would be fine. Okay, perfect, thank you. There's a question in the chat, Leslie, uh, are, the, are the three areas the same as in past years? Yes. That has not changed in the DD Act. Any other questions? Hi there. Um, this is Jillian Oper at, um, from the Nice Longer Center. And um, one of the questions that we talked about um, before today is um, 
whether um, a program uh, could zero in on, you know, let's say working with people on the autism spectrum or how, um, how inclusive of all DD do we need to be in, in the scope of our projects? Um, so are you asking if you can have a grant that wouldn't necessarily focus um, primarily on individuals with DD? Is that what you're asking? It, it, it would, it would, but it would focus probably um, then even further um, on individuals with um, autism spectrum disorder or, or people on the spectrum. Okay, so you're asking if it would, um, it's okay to focus on a certain disability group instead of all people with um, developmental disabilities. Yes, correct. Uh, yes, you can do that. Okay, thank you. Um, and it was the, <laughs> it was the uh, emerging advocates one that is for folks ages 21 and under roughly. Yeah, I would say, like I said, it's not defined, but that's when the committee discussed it, that's what they were thinking of. They were thinking of more um, youth that would still be in school. All right, thank you. Leslie, you have another question in the chat, uh, and I think it's about the Empowering People with Disabilities grant it's saying, so the max amount for the five-year cycle is 70,000, but 10 to 35 each year, question mark? The in that pot of money, there'll be seventy thousand um, per year, but a grant can ask for ten to thirty-five per year. So, um, if we get three grants totaling seventy thousand, so that's that's does that make sense? So we could have two grants for thirty-five thousand if you did it that way, or you know whatever mixture of. You got a yes, that makes sense. Okay. And a thank you. You're welcome. I would love to see some, we, we usually don't get a lot of grants that support and expand individuals with disabilities to participate in cross disability and culturally diverse leadership. And, I think that one would be interesting. If you, there's also some resources on um, different ways councils have worked in these areas um, that are available from our ITAC. If anybody's interested in that, they can send me a message and I can send that to you. And you have uh, Dana Charlton has raised her hand for a question. Okay, Dana? <laughs> Just quickly, um, OSDA has had grants in the past um, under this state plan. And I just wondered if there were any special considerations or special requirements of an entity that's applying for another five-year round. <laughs> that's a, that's a um, we are going to be discussing that at our next council meeting. And okay. it could be that you would just need a vote by council. Okay, but thank you. No problem. I, I also, could you say a few more words about the, um, I guess, expectation around the cross disability and culturally diverse? You know, I think that that one's the hardest one. I know when I sat on a work group for the national trying to come up with projects for cross disability and culture, I, it's, um, you know, trying to get diversity in leadership organizations. I think that might be one. Um, I'm trying to think of some model programs that um, people have, but I can't, I'm flustered right now and I can't really think of it. Uh, like I said, I can, if somebody is interested in how other councils have worked in that area, I can send you um, a link to. Thank um, you, that would be helpful. Some examples. Okay. Okay. I'll... You have more questions in the chat, Leslie, uh, regarding the emerging self-advocacy section. 
What about a range of ages in a program, for instance, teens, adults? Um, emerging, okay, what, teens, adults, what does that mean? Is that like transition age? Is that what? Like a range of ages. Uh, um, sorry, this is Tema Kremfley from the Nice Songo Center. Um, so a program that addresses uh, teenagers and adults instead of just youth. Would that be uh, considered? Would that be um, applicable? Uh, the panel might consider it. I, I'm not entirely sure. Um, like I said, we had been mostly talking about um, 21 and under, but if um, something a grant worked on under 21 but included adults, that might be fine. I, I, you know, it depends what the panel thought. I'm sorry, that sounds wishy-washy. Anything else? Now, I, I will say um, about the emerging self-advocacy and teens, adults, um, I currently have a grant in employment that was dealing mainly with, it was funded to work with kids that were school age. And after they got going, they were able to add adults. And that was actually a good benefit to the grant, um, being able to expand that way. So I think if you could show, yeah, it's gonna work on those emerging advocates, but we can expand it, that, that might work. This is Jillian Ober, sorry, one more time. Would you, um reiterate the maximum amount. Um, I see, I, I noted the, the maximum amount for the empowering people with disabilities would be 35. 35. Right. Oh, is there a maximum amount that I missed for the um, emerging advocates? Uh, I believe that's 85. Okay, so that one is 85. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. That's, that's gonna be one grantee. Got it, thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Now I'm looking at all, all the question, uh, comments. Um, I do have another question. This is Leslie from Upside of Downs. Mm -hmm. um, once we are done with these bidding conferences this week and next week, um, if any of us are in the throes of writing a grant and would have a question, would we refer back to each of you that highlighted each of these grants during this? Yes. We had a question. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, please do. You can ask any question. And I will tell you, I over the years, I, it seems like the closer you get to the deadline, the more calls you're getting. Or, or an email. And I'd like to say that, um, at least for me, since we're not in the office very much, it would be the best would be to reach out to me um, via email. And then, um, then we can give us a phone number and we can give you a call or whatever. That is the best way to do it.
Any other questions? I know my grant review panels always love when I've got these, we're selecting more than one because it gets difficult. <laughs> Let's see, were you mentioning a link? Are you going to share that in the um, chat? Yeah, it might folks? be able, since I'm sitting here, I will get that to people. Take me a minute. I, I apologize. Okay, that link I sent has ITAP. It goes to self-advocacy resources for DD councils and other resources. And if you go to understanding advocacy through DD council lens, and there's, it talks about the three areas that council has to work on. Well, Leslie, I have a question. Oh, good. Just out of curiosity, um, could two different entities apply for two separate things like emerging self advocates and empowering 
advocacy and collaborate, share their skills and their knowledge and kind of collaborate. It would be two separate projects, but linked together. I don't see why not. Okay. I don't think that would be any issue. I don't, I'm trying to think of the, any kind of fiscal issues and I can't really think of any, so. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Now and remember what I said in the first session, collaboration, leveraging your dollars, and find out ways to sustain yourself are very high things that our funding source is looking for us to get grantees to do. So that does sound pretty good, Dana. We're talking about collaboration, you know, leveraging dollars, all of that is, uh, to me, is a big plus. I'm not in leadership and help, but um, just knowing what our funder says is asking us to have grantees do, that sounds absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I'm thinking that would be a good thing too. Thank you, appreciate the clarification. Uh, will this PowerPoint, um, are we putting the PowerPoint up? Paul said he was gonna to talk to Kim about putting it up and you remember, this, today's uh, all today's session since it's recorded is going to be on our website too so but but the powerpoint is a critical piece and so he's going to talk to kim about putting that up so people will have it you know for both days so i, um, I think it will be uh we have to ask yeah, kim this is this is kim here good. Um, oh, good. the powerpoint uh just the slides are already up on the website um, you can find them on the home page, or um, it directs you also to a page that has them. And then, yes, we are going to be putting the um, both this week and next week's um, videos will be posted on this as well. See how good she is? She's already got it done. We were talking about a mute issue. She's got the PowerPoints already up there. Good job, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> all right well it's just about out it's outreach's time so i'm assuming there's no more quick questions You finished, Leslie? Yep, I'm done. Okay, I didn't want to run into you. <laughs> Ken, you have muted yourself. Oh, thanks, Paul. I'm sorry. I didn't realize I had done that. Okay. 
And again, I don't, did you hear my introduction before or was I mute, muted at that time? Yeah, you were muted the whole time. Oh, okay, thanks Paul. All right, uh, again, like I said, my name is Ken Latham and uh, we're getting ready to get into the uh, outreach committee grants. And, uh, but before we do, uh, that's good, Paul. Uh, I would like to say, as it was said, as it was said earlier, uh, a lot of times the, uh, our government uh, reporting agency that uh, we discuss our, our, our grants with sometimes actually ask us, uh, ask us who we are uh, distributing our funding to, what grants we are working with in the community. And sometimes uh, they do make suggestions uh, about what grants we should be uh, approaching and also uh, spending, uh, distributing our money to. So uh, that's uh, oftentimes is why outreach have uh, various types of grants, very unique grants in the sense that uh, it's trying to cover as many possible, uh, any population as uh, as possible. So, as we go start out, um, as the slide is uh, is saying, anyone who is awarded an outreach grant can see that based upon the purpose of the project, you will realize that you already have a target a targeted population who you are to underserve. And again, that's different from the other committee grants because um, you have to declare, you get a choice uh, in the other committee grants of what population uh, you will serve or you, you want to serve. In the outreach grants, the uh, populations are already directed towards you to be, uh, to be involved in. Our grants are basically different than uh, any other grants on, on the council committee. Uh, when you apply for these grants, you will meet the, the same requirements though, in terms of uh, the four, uh, on chapter four of our grant applications, you will still be required to fill out the unserved and underserved population uh, uh, grant requirements, the nine questions. Uh, Paul, can we go to the next play slide, please? Uh, I'm not going to go through them as in depth as I did the first time around, but yeah, you still are, are going to be required to fill out uh, the nine questions. And basically what you're going to be doing is fill them out, filling these questions out uh, in relationship to the uh, grant that you're, you're, applying, you're applying for, um, such as uh, LGBTQ, or the human trafficking. You know yourself, if you're applying for either one of those grants, uh, you know the population that you will be working with. And as it relates to the questions that you're responding to, you know, you should know the probably the answers to these questions and what you need to, and how you need to answer them as it relates to those two populations or any other population that you are responding to in the, uh, outreach section. So as, as we went over them before, but more in depth, and I'm not going to go into them in depth, is who, who, is, who are the unserved populations that you're going to be working with? Identify unserved populations. Describe their needs or any barriers uh, of those populations. Describe the affirmative and proactive outreach activities you will perform with these populations. List the key community uh, uh, people and organizations that you've come in contact with to help you uh, work towards the goals and outcomes that uh, you want to pursue with any of, any of our outreach grants. How will you measure your progress? How will you sustain the, the project after uh, you have you are part of, uh, no longer a part of council's funding. Uh, how will you address unseen, unforeseen barriers, and uh, and how will you report the disparities in the grant projects that you are you are working with? So you know the the, the questions are the same. It's just that you're going to address the questions as it relates to the 
population that you've been designated to work with in the outreach grant. So that's pretty. Kim, may I say something? Yes, go ahead. Um, my, I'm the ticket Diana Ayers, and I work part time on outreach, so I work with Ken on this. So essentially, the first three bullets, actually the first two bullets, council is already done. If you look in the plan language, actually, it's actually the first three bullets, council is already done for you. If you look into the objective, the impact, and the and the rationale of the project description, just cut and paste that stuff out. Now you may have in your research additional information to add to describe their needs and any barriers to service. And, and, you, and especially if you're an agency who's already working with the LGBTQ population, you may know stuff that we don't know, and that's okay. And, but the first three bullets, we kind of answer for you in our project language. You can just add to it or embellish and put your flavor to it, but we've kind of did your work for you. But from the bullets, from describe the affirmative to list key community people, what are your plans to sustain? How will you measure? All that stuff is on you to do from your own skills sets or the work that you, or the people that you are currently working with to help you fill out the application. All of that is on you. We've helped you with the first two, two or three bullets ourselves. Okay, that's kind of what we're, we're trying to say in this section. With the human trafficking, it's the same. It's people of color with a disability. That, that's who your target is. So we already did it for you. So you can add more stuff to explain what the barriers are based on your perception or the work you've done or, or research you've done. That's cool. That just, that just beefs up uh, what we've done and enhance what we've already written for you. But the rest of the work is on you that I've just stated. Okay, I'm through. Okay, uh, Paul, can we go to the next slide? Okay, getting into the grant specifically, uh, the Reach Out eDiversity Newsletter. And as you see on the slide, the diversity newsletter is a bi-monthly electronic newsletter. Because it's an, uh, an electronic publication, its expectations are to cover various ethnic groups, geographic locations, articles on diversity and inclusion, cultural competence and cultural linguistics, disparities, implicit bias, stakeholders, government agencies, and many areas surrounding people with disabilities. And we normally have no less than probably four different topics uh, bi-monthly that we, we cover in the newsletter. Uh, the newsletter is, again, we look at the newsletter as not only just a, uh, an electric, electronic publication, but it's a training tool, it's an educational tool, it influences other uh, uh, agencies, private and government sectors in, um, in their area of collaboration, cultural competence, uh, trainings and things of that nature, best practices. And uh, it makes um, other agencies and individuals um, make them aware of what council does, what council uh, is uh, involved with as it relates to diversity and inclusion. Uh, we compare notes and, and act, like I say, best practices with agencies. It covers a variety of things, and uh, and its and its purpose is to reach people who are not only unserved and underserved, but maybe even help them navigate the system. And um, uh, it's a very empowering uh, newsletter. So that's just a kind of a brief overview about the Reach Out uh, e Diversity newsletter. the The next project is the uh, Amish community project, um, and it's a unique project. It, we, it took us about five or six years to uh, get involved with the Amish project, I mean, Amish community up in uh, the northern part of Ohio, and that was because, you know, the Amish community is a closed community, so um, you have to really be 
have some connections or some insight in terms of, uh, you know, what they're doing in that community in the area of health. And we were lucky enough to find a uh, genetics research group up in, uh, up in the northern part of Ohio. And um, they were doing the Amish community project. And it, like I say, the applicant who was awarded this project must focus on and work with the Amish community regarding health, research, discovery, as well as solutions. The grantee must educate the communities, train professionals, and collaborate with other medical facilities. And um, it also does treatment with the Amish families. Uh, again, uh, collaborate with the hospitals and medical professionals, as well as teachers and community live, uh, leaders and deals with uh, children with special needs. So the Amish project is again, uh, a very strong project and a, a very unique project that uh, we have to offer in uh, this five year cycle uh, of grants. Now we've talked briefly about uh, the next uh, slide, Paul, thank you. Then we've talked briefly about the LGBTQ and the human trafficking project. Now this is a, these, both of these projects are brand new uh, to council. We've never dealt with any projects uh, concerning the LGBTQ community and the human trafficking uh, community. Now, what makes these, these projects uh, unique is that we've added an, an extra twist that would fit our requirements as it, were, um, as it relates to the disability community. And that, in, that means that it's, uh, uh, individuals and family members uh, or the, any community members that in the LGBTQ community with a disability. And also, we like to also include people of color who are LGBTQ and also have a disability. So th this project is our brand new and, and we know that there's a lot of information out there on LGBTQ, but then council have never compiled any information of their own. So this is why it's unique to council and we're gonna find it very interesting. And the first year is gonna be uh, uh, to develop a white paper, to give us information, explore some of the things that we can assist with in the DD community and, this, uh, and uh, the Ohio DD Council to assist uh, this population in whatever the needs, whatever their barriers are and, and things of this nature. And uh, I personally have had the opportunity to meet people and to talk to different people in the in various agencies uh, in the LGBTQ community. So I'm really excited about having this project in the outreach committee to, to begin to explore uh, what's going on and what are the, what are the needs uh, in this community. The same with the human trafficking community. Um, as we all know, the human trafficking uh, situation has been really blowing up in terms of, I know the news media in terms of uh, uh, special special uh, initiatives to bust, bust the human trafficking ring and thing of that, things of that nature. And again, our twist as it relates to the human uh, trafficking project also deals with people that are caught up in the human trafficking uh, um, uh, whores and experiences that are people with disabilities. We wanna know, we want to know through our white paper, how much this exists, what, how much exists in this population and also people of color uh, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, area of human trafficking. So these are the two newest uh, uh, projects coming out of the outreach committee that we're really excited about, and uh, uh, because we've never dealt with uh, with these populations before, 
And just like it was said earlier, again, the government has often asked us if we're dealing or assisting people in the LGBTQ community. And periodically, every year they or so, when we're reporting at the end of the year, we find something that we can add to our project group to, uh, to explore. And as I said before, it's usually something that council has never dealt with before. So that makes it really exciting in terms of trying to find out and compile information uh, for council as we can assist some of these issues in the, in the disability community. So that's basically where we are as it relates to the um, outreach committee and its uh, grant initiatives. And so- um, May I say something, Ken? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, when we're talking about the two white papers, the LGBTQ and the human trafficking white paper, the idea is that as you develop your paper and, and finalize it, that you will have recommendations in there of things that we can fund so that as you go into the second year of the project, we can, you, we can, you can work with the committee and say, hey, we want to fund, we want council to help us work on this recommendation. And so that, so that your white paper becomes something that's alive and not something that's sitting on a shelf and everybody said it's a good job. We want you to have, so, be, so if you're, because it's a five-year project, so if you know the first year you're, you're doing a white paper, you're not doing a white paper for five years, you're doing it for that year with the idea that in that white paper, you will have recommendations of things that we can fund throughout the next four years. My community, community living, we did that before, and it was wonderful. It was the Removing the Mask Project. And they had a lot of recommendations. And what we did is we took our time and we funded almost every recommendation that was in there that would create a systems change. So that's what we're hoping for in these two white papers, that they are papers that come alive, that we can look in and see the recommendations. And actually, with the amount of funding that's been set aside, we're able to build on that and actually implement or at least start working on some of the things that are in the white paper. Okay, so keep that in mind as you're creating the white paper. And also with the Amish project, if you look at the title of it, it's called Detecting Specific Disorders for the Amish and non-Amish community projects. So now we have extended the focus past just the Amish. We did a different twist. We're still gonna work with the Amish, but we're gonna extend it to the non-Amish communication uh, community so that we can expand the project and meet and, and, and try to do uh, additional, uh, provide assistance to additional populations that are non-Amish. So I just wanted to point those things out uh, so you understand um, the outreach perspective. And the, uh, the Reach Out University newsletter is funded for $30,000. Uh, the Amish project is funded for $50,000. The LGBTQ project is $30,000 and the human trafficking is uh, $30,000 a year. Each of these are for, for five years. And so they are, their funding is uh, based on five years. So that's, that's what that is for these projects, for the outreach projects. And it's interesting about the empowering reach out e diversity newsletter. That newsletter kind of talks about top topics that people don't really want to talk about. You know, we're talking about implicit bias. We may talk about racism. We may talk about uh, what's going on in the Latino community. Or we may talk about, you know, what are some cultural competencies that an agency needs to think about as they're working with different populations. So it's a very expansive and it's very um, informative and it's designed to help change the culture 
of an organization, or at least give them something to think about what they're doing as they're supporting people with disabilities and families. Since our population is becoming more and more diverse, each agency has to find a way to work with them. And so that newsletter, is, it kind of touches upon all of that and has been quite informative and educational for those agencies who are trying to transform how they provide services or how they interact with the public uh, that are from different ethnicities or even non-speaking uh, not English speaking population. How do we interact with them? What do we do, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that, that newsletter is pretty powerful and it's supposed to be transforming agencies and even people, the individual peoples who read it. It gives them something to think about as we do our interpersonal relationships with one another. Because I've learned things. As just forget about the DD Council, just me as an individual, I learned something. Okay, I need to act this way. I need to respond this way. I need to such and such and such. So it's a very helpful tool to help you grow as this population is is becoming more diversified. And, and, and you're right, Fatika, because one of the things that that is a key with the with the grantees, whoever uh, is awarded the newsletter, is that uh, most of the articles and and uh, uh, initiatives that uh, are discussed in the newsletter, a lot of it is done by research. It's not just going in and putting an article together, but a lot of this information is 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 researched. Not all of it, but there's a lot of it that is that is researched and that it challenges the reader. We call it a call to action. It challenges the reader to, you know, to do to challenge their organization to do this or do that, so on and so forth. And that's why I say it's not only a electronic publication, but it's a training tool. It's a natural training tool in the sense that yes. uh, it's deep, deep thinking, deep thoughts are, are, are compiled uh, in this newsletter to challenge you. So, so that's just, you know, again, uh, but, uh, Some topics have been uncomfortable. It's yes. the stuff that people don't really want to talk about, but yes. it must be talked about because it's happening in this country, in, yes. in this in this state. And so you need to address it so that you can be able to uh, deal with it if it affects your organization or your family member or whomever. So it's a pretty powerful newsletter that is transforming and makes people think about the world around them. And, and thank you, Stephanie. Stephanie writes that she loves the newsletter. So we appreciate that. And uh, so, Yes, the newsletter is, is very powerful. The newsletter is very insightful. So uh, with that, uh, that's all I have to say at this end. If you have questions, Paul, please let, let us know. Now, as we said in the earlier uh, sessions, the PowerPoint Kim has already put on our website and she put in the chat box in the last session where you can find it. Um, this whole presentation today is going to be, it's recorded and it's going to be on our website. So if you want to go back and listen to what you heard Ken or I say, you can, you'll be able to do that or see the information that's been presented. It's all going to be on our website for you. Ken will also be available to you to answer any questions you have as you get into your project. One of the things Paul Jarvis said in the earlier session is that staff is always amenable to help you as you go through your grant writing process. If all of a sudden you have a question, um, you can call him or better email him because we're working from home and then we do our emails every day and then he will call you uh, from his cell phone. 
Uh, and if he has to call me, do a three-way, he'll do that. But he can usually handle things on his own. So feel free to call Ken at any time during this process if you have any questions, you know, right when you're trying to fill out your application. But know that all the materials is going to be on our website along with this recording to assist you or for you to share with other people that may not was able to come and you want them to see what you learn, you'll be able to share this on our website. So I did just have a question. In general, um, how many applications for projects do you get each year for each one of these? Is there an average amount or is it really all over the board? It's all over the map. Okay. Depending on what the project is, you can get anywhere from two to six, maybe even 10. You might even get one. Okay. So it's just, uh, you never know what people's interests are. And so we just kind of wait and see <laughs> kind of thing. That right. has been my experience. And I've been in this over 30 some years. And so it just ranges. It just depends on what people's thought process are, what people want to work on, what their passion is as to how many grants we will get. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, babe. Well, at 405, the public awareness grant will take place and our lovely staff person, Miss Kimmy, she'll be running that session. So Ken is still here until uh, 405 to answer any questions that you might have for him or I about the outreach projects. If not, we're still, as Paul said in previous sessions, we're going to keep the line open and then at 4.05, we will go into the public awareness grant, uh, grants. I'm gonna go get me some water. One of the things that, uh, as it relates to the uh, human trafficking, uh, I was always interested in learning that uh, it just didn't revolve around uh, sexual content, but, but the labor content also. And I had the opportunity to attend about a, a six months to eight months of uh, human trafficking events. And I had the opportunity to sit down and meet people who were involved in, who had been caught up in that uh, scenario and, and, our, and were human trafficking survivors. So um, I always found out that that found out that that was, um, very interesting, very horrifying experience uh, for people who were who were caught up in that. And lately, there's been a a lot of bust and 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 things with uh, the enforcement uh, officers in that area. So I'm I'm looking forward to try to 
assist or contribute any way we can uh, from a DD Council perspective. And the same thing with the LGBTQ, LGBTQ uh, community. Um, having the opportunity to, to meet with uh, uh, people in uh, the Stonewall, the Stonewall organization and talk, uh, talk with uh, some of their uh, workers uh, who were interested also in the, uh, the grant project. So uh, those, those two, I mean, I, I love all four of our, our projects, but those two are, since they're brand new, I'm really excited to see, uh, see what develops from those projects. And to, and to see what recommendations we get uh, from the white paper. Well, we have four minutes, then Kim will be up. And then I am the last show for the day at 4.40. I'm Batika Dineers, I'm with the Community Living Committee. I'm at the end of the day. <laughs> Don't make oh me mute you, Fatika. You said what? Don't make me mute you. <laughs> I'm giving you myself, Paul, so you don't have to do it now. Abusing your privilege over there. That's because it's the end of the day, Paul. I'm sorry. Can I ask a more broad question and I don't know who I'm directing it to. So I'm just gonna ask it and whoever wants to answer, go ahead and answer. Um, this is Jesse Green, I'm at the Dice Songer Center. Um, there are several of us who were looking at a couple different projects and I know at the beginning and I can't remember whose presentation it was in, there's the getting approval if more than, was it $100,000 I believe. Um, is that per year, per award? for the whole five years, how, how does that, do we have to let you know ahead of time or is that dealt with through the awarding of the grants? How does that work? Yeah, uh, this is Paul Jarvis. Um, I, I, so our policy generally, I think Patika refer, uh, referenced it in the beginning, but our policy essentially is, um, you know, if you win a single grant more than $100,000, it's not a problem. Okay. Um, if you win multiple grants that, where the sum of those grants exceed $100,000, uh, then there must be a consideration by the council and a vote to approve the um, to, to approve multiple projects uh, occur, being awarded to a single one. Um, so that generally, if, if you're applying for multiple grants, you might want to include Somewhere in the application, we are applying for this grant and another grant um, to, uh, our, I'm sure our fiscal staff will catch it, but to alert us to the fact that if you go through competitive review and you win separately competitive reviews that cause your, the sum of your awards to exceed $100,000, we must then go to council that'll occur, that would occur in our October meeting. Okay. Uh, so if, if that were to happen, you're probably going to be delayed pro uh, roughly a week okay. um, uh, for, for that consideration. And then there must be an approval of three-fourths of the full council, the full membership of the council in order to allow an entity to receive multiple projects exceeding $100,000. Okay. And is that $100,000 for the total award over the five years or for... Because a few of them yeah. are not, can be single year awards. So, so it would be based on the one year award okay. uh, because the assumption is, is once you get that approval, you're good for the next Five. four years. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we're ready to move on to 
public awareness. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kim Schof, and I'll be talking with you about the uh, public awareness grant. Um, at DD Council, I am what they call the electronic design specialist, which basically means I'm the communication specialist. And I also oversee the supportive and assistive technology grants that council funds. Um, additionally, I work with council staff person Carla Cox to oversee the public awareness grant. Um, she was on the agenda to present today, um, but is out of town this week. Um, so I am presenting on her behalf, although I do work very closely with this grant. Um, the purpose of the public awareness grant is to provide information to all Ohioans about issues that people with developmental disabilities experience, and also to spread the word about DD Councils so people know who we are, what we do, and also as a tool to try to seek out new members that can be appointed to council. Um, we'd like to focus, as you've heard throughout all the presentations today, on the unserved and underserved areas and populations of Ohio. Um, so we do um, have that as a part of the expectation. Um, the public awareness grant has been around for many years. Um, throughout the years, I believe we've had three different grantees. Um, and as with, if you work in that uh, industry, you know that things change all the time from at one time publications and print media was the big thing. Uh, now it's digital media. So that's why in the title of this grant, you'll see that we, we specifically say public awareness using digital media for people with DD, uh, because that seems to be the best way to reach out to people now. So the expectation in all the activities is that it will be done using social media, uh, digital media, um, but, but we still do print publications, press releases and all that as well. Um, so basically this grant, the duration is five years contingent on an annual grant review and the amount of funding per year is 80,000. Next slide, please. Um, so listed on here is the key activities, which I'd like to go over, um, pretty quickly about. Um, first, the grantee will create, is expected to create innovative ideas using, again, communication tools and techniques for implementing public awareness campaigns. Um, specific information and outreach campaigns will be identified by council in concert with the grantee. Um, all campaigns and messages will focus on self-determination of people with DD. And whenever possible, we always want to highlight the actual voice of the person with a disability. So we like to use them, whether it's on video or um, you know, in publications, whatever it might be, we like to have their true voice being heard. Um, next, the grantee will create innovative ideas for highlighting DD Council members and council activities again, using social media and other digital tools. Uh, the overall goal is to, again, increase interest for potential new members and new grantees. Uh, next, the grantee will assist council in ensuring that materials produced by the council are developed in accessible um, and user-friendly formats. This also includes the use of clear language with uh, which Leslie went over earlier today and also person first language. Um, this includes in any messaging we do, online messaging, email campaigns, videos, you name it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, the grantee will incorporate council's visual identity and brand in all of the products and activities. Um, although most of our materials are offered online, we do still create publications that are available in PDF and depending on the publication, we do print some hard copies. The grantee will be asked to format and design these materials while being very consistent with our brand. 
Um, next, we request that grantee on occasion will produce multilingual copies of products. Um, we don't do this a lot right now, but we foresee being, doing this more in the future. Um, and it's usually we will, we will identify which products will be like that. Uh, next, as the products are developed, the grantee will work with council staff to create a dissemination plan uh, to reach the targeted audiences. And that includes the unserved and underserved um, areas and populations. Um, the grantee will work directly with me, um, mainly, uh, to coordinate social media posts. Um, I manage the website for the, for the council, so the grantee will not have to do that, but to work with me um, to create content for it. Uh, we also have a monthly newsletter and a lot of other um, monthly things that we do. Uh, the grantee will be expected to establish a working relationship with the media, and this includes developing press releases, uh, responding to inquiries, and so on. And finally, the grantee will assist all council staff with other public awareness projects. Um, so some of our other grantees, uh, if they have a need for something that needs to be um, Uh, they, they want something promoted a little bit, um, or they need some help getting a message out or a press release, the public awareness grantee will offer, it's not really offering their services, but as a part of their um, work, they will help out with that. So those are the key activities in a nutshell. Um, I'm open to any questions, uh, if you have them. All right, you're gonna make it easy for me. Well, if there's no questions, I'm done. Well, just hang tight, Kim, uh, in case anybody does come up with a question. I think we're going to wait to start Patika's session. The final session of the day is uh, slated to begin at uh, what time? Five, four, four, four thirty, four forty, four thirty-five, four thirty-five. All right. I need to figure out how to put the uh, the Jeopardy music uh, while you're waiting, right? Maybe I'll do that for next week.
Well, we got two minutes and look like we have 14 faithful people who stayed to the end of the day. Thank you so much for staying for the last session of the day, the Community Living Committee grants. Mm -hmm. All right, it's 440. 
it's time for my session. And um, just so you know, uh, we decided to stay with the timelines because we know that some people have planned their workday around specific sessions that they want to go to. So even though the session before might've got done a little earlier, we didn't want to get started early. We wanted to respect the fact that this is what the time we said, and this is what we're going to do. I want to also put out there that has been already said in other sessions, this is being recorded and uh, everything will be up on our website. So if you missed the morning session and there's things you'd like to know or hear what we said, you'll be able to go and hear all the presentations that took place this morning. Kim has already put the PowerPoints from this session and the other sessions that took place before mine on our website. So you will have it there. I will say this from the onset. My name is Vatika Diana Ayers and I am the staff person to the Community Living Committee. And um, you can, as you go through the process of your application and you have, still have questions after this, just email me and I will get back with you immediately. Um, I am working from home, and in some cases, I give people my cell phone number if it's that critical. Um, but if you email me, I'll get back with you right away. With all that said, let's go in and look at the two only grants that, that's coming out of my committee. The first one is called the DSP White Paper in Action. Ohioans with disabilities have difficulty obtaining safe, affordable, and appropriate transportation. In 2012, the Ohio DD Council funded the Athens On Demand Transit Project. This project has been successful in offering transportation option in the rural area of Ohio, which is Athens County. To further these efforts, this project will conduct a pilot program using technology when necessary that allows the Athens On Demand to provide rides outside of Athens County. And this project is required to work with interested counties to replicate the work they do. Oh, wait a minute, that's the wrong one. This, this is a transportation when she got the wrong name. Sorry, this is the transportation project. Let me see. Okay, okay, sorry about that. But it has the same words, so I hope that, it has different ones. Okay. One of the things you need to know about this project is that it's going to develop a system for out of county transportation for individuals with disability, the IE scheduling drivers and uh, vehicle needs. They're going to seek technology to assist in the scheduling and dispatch of out of county trips. They're going to determine major trip generators for individuals with disabilities traveling out of the county to assist in data collection, needs of the community, community and future planning. They're going to determine the cost of trip generators for individuals with disabilities traveling out of the county to assist in data collection, future planning, and need. The Athens Hawking Mobility Management Program will conduct outreach to counties interested in replicating exactly what they're doing. Uh, they would do conduct trainings, program overviews for counties interested in replicating uh, what they're doing. They will also provide support for applications for county applying for the replication of this. And they will work with uh, the Athens to host interested counties and discuss funding op operation of the program. So while this is a competitive project, it is. It is designed for Athens on demand, but Athens on the Mind is required to work with those counties who want to do or do something similar to what they're doing. So if you're not with Athens on Demand, I would tell, I would encourage you to get with them and just tell them you want to be a part of the project, or whatever manner that is. Um, like I said, it is competitive. And so if there's other counties that apply and, and the application exceeds what Athens are going to, what Athens apply for, if they apply, we will still tell Athens County to work with you, even if you get it. But the idea is that Athens will continue to work on making transportation available outside of Athens County and to support other counties in the Appalachia area who wants to learn how to do exactly what they're doing. So 
Does anybody have any questions about this project before I go to the DSP white paper? So again, and what I always tell, I've been saying in everybody's session, collaboration, leveraging of dollars, and how to sustain yourself is critical. One thing I can say about Athens On Demand, that's what they have done. They figured out how to leverage dollars. They figured out how to collaborate. So you need to work with them on that. And they figured out how to sustain themselves to the point that now they're part of the public transit authority. And, and we want them to go outside of Athens County to help other people with disabilities and the public. Uh, one thing about this project too, while the federal, the federal statute says the emphasis is on people with disabilities, if it affects the people uh, at public at home, that's even better. So the focus is on people with disabilities, but it's, if it impacts the public as a whole, like this project has, it, it helps with the elegy, the um, elderly, it's been helping veterans and, and, and all sorts of groups uh, get to where they need to go. And what I like about it, if, if you let them work with you or you apply for the grant and we tell you to work with them, is it's for trips that are not just to the, to the hospital, to school, and to work. But we're hoping that you do trips to a family reunion or, or to the fair, something fun that's a part of community life. You know, not just going, just the basic thing, employment and to the doctor and maybe school. But we want people to express life outside of those entities or those, those venues, but do fun stuff. And that's what we're hoping, go shopping somewhere outside of your county and, and do something. And that's what the whole premise of this is. Um, anybody have any questions? If not, I'm gonna go on to the DSP white paper. I know county is having problem transit, should be in all counties to get help. I know, oh, there's Brenda. That's one of our council members in Ottawa. Yeah, thank you, Brenda, for your comment. Okay, let's go on to the DSP white paper. Okay. The DSP white paper, let, let me talk about that. Council have done a lot of work in the DSP area as far as credentialing and competency-based and actually supporting a DSPs to um, have a voice. The Ohio Alliance of Direct Support Professionals, along with uh, other stakeholders, as well as members from the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities, they did come together as a unit and they wrote a white paper on DSP. And in that white paper, they have recommendations of where they think this field should go in the next five years. Now, again, this white paper is not the answer to every problem uh, that, that's facing DSP or the issue of the DSP crisis, but it's a start to continue the work. So the whole point is to take that white paper and put it in action. We're tired of people writing documents that we read and then we put on the shelf and say, well done. This is one of them documents we wanna to put to action. We want people to do something with it. So one of the key activities that we want is for a group, whomever that might be, to come together and have a process or a mechanism to have a quarterly diverse uh, individual with developmental disabilities and direct support professionals, along with other stakeholders to review the white paper. Then to obtain input from individuals with disabilities regarding skills and training needs of DSPs. Who's the best to tell you what they need if you're gonna be supporting them are people with disabilities. So they should be a part of anything you wanna do when it comes to competency base or training for DSPs. And then include the personal experiences and interactions between DSPs and individuals with disabilities in any work that you decide to do. 
the type of skills and trainings DSP may need to be individual in the individualized service plan, a self-determined and consumer control plan or process. Then you need as a group, as, as you establish your group, you need to determine what recommendations will be implemented, determine how they will, how the recommendations will be implemented, and then they implement the darn stuff. You know, you got five years to do it and report such findings to the Community Living Committee of the DD Council. So we want you to take a look at that paper, figure out in that paper what makes sense that you can do. We, uh, that, that project has $40,000 available for them for the next five years. So you do bits and pieces. Everything doesn't have to be done, you know, the first year. The first year may be just sitting there, reading it, arguing over it, and then developing a plan of what recommendations you want to tackle. Now, the good thing about council is this. If there's some activities that are not in the plan, in the DSP white paper, that you feel like could be added, add them. The, the white paper is, is just the, the, the lynch board or the jumping pad. It's the starting point. for So the people have to point, well, what do I do? What do I do? Start with the white paper. And then in the white paper, if, you, if there's something in there, but you feel like there's something that should be added to the white paper to enhance some recommendation that's in there, say so. Because if you get awarded the grant, council, you'll find council is very flexible. You might get started on a recommendation that sounded so good. And as you get down the road, you're going, well, this ain't working. Then you come to me, you tell me that, and I'll tell the committee that, and I'll probably have you come to the committee meeting and then we'll brainstorm together. Okay, what, how do we need to tweak this? so that we can get down the road because the goal of the project is that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are provided services and support by direct support professionals that are knowledgeable, trained, and supported. Boom, that's the goal. So whatever you're doing, that overall, that's the goal. Now the objective and the impact of the project is that by the end of year one, the grantee would have reviewed the white paper, developed by the Ohio Department of Development and Disabilities and Ohio Alliance and determine what recommendations will be implemented. So you'll probably, if you get the grant, when, when it's time for you to, you would have come to the committee before it's time to do your uh, state plan update or your work plan update. And you would tell us, this is what we're gonna be doing the second year of the grant. Now, like Paul said, in the in your application, you kind of write it like a five-year spread. But then when you actually get the grant, we do it year by year so that you can determine what makes sense. Because what you makes what makes sense and what you wrote at the beginning that you got approved for might not make sense as you actually get into the development or implementation of the grant. And council was very flexible with that. We won't say, oh no, stick with what you said. Now we're like, okay, if you got a good rational explanation because the political environment has changed or new money has been flushed into the system that allow us to do more creative things and so we need to change direction, cool, go with the flow. All you have to do is let us know and we'll be in with you to make it happen. But I will be the staff person at this time that will be working with you every step of the way. And again, like I said in the previous uh, session, we're not here to beat you up. We're not the taskmaster whipping you with the whip, get it done. We're here as your partner. And so if there's something you can't think of, Ask us, maybe we can think of it and can help you because when you succeed, we succeed. And we want this paper to come to life. We want to make sure that people with intellectual disabilities are provided with service and support by direct support professionals that are knowledgeable, trained, and that the DSPs are supported as well, whatever that means. And everybody has their take. The white paper kind of gives you a clue. We'll start with the white paper and we'll build on to that. 
So that's basically um, what this project's about. Get that white paper and let's do something with it. If you want to add something to it to make it better, to make it come alive, hey, let's talk about that and let's do it. But let's do something. Let's get out of the talking phase and let's actually do something uh, with the white paper. So with that said, it, does anybody have any questions for me about the DSP white paper? Hey, Fatika, this is Brenda. If you realize that I, I know it's all over, but if you think that there's problems with DSPs, they should hire some more. But then again, you got to say because of the COVID, because I know our county is going left and right from DSPs. They're going, they're coming, they're going. So there's... And see, so that's why it has become a crisis. Who anticipated a pandemic? We already knew about the flu, but who knew about COVID and who knew about the mutation? And so that's why, you know, if people, as they're working with the white paper, they think of things that will complement or, or go outside of the white paper to, to look at the pandemic and how to support DSPs, whatever that might be, because if council had the answer, we would do it. But the, we're, we're, we're building on someone else's work because we want to support, support movement, continue movement in this area of direct support professional because they're critical. I know they're critical because my late mother had to use them. When she got dementia, I didn't know what to do. And I relied on these well-trained people to come in my home and help me with my mom times when I were crying and I couldn't understand. I needed these people to help me support my mother to live in her home. I didn't want her going anywhere else. I, and you know what? She ended up dying in my home with a DSP by her side. So this project means a lot to me because I have experienced what a good direct support professional can do and enhance the life of folks who need it, whether you're a person with a developmental disability or whether you're elderly or whether you have dementia or, or whether you have Alzheimer's or whatever it is. If you have these trained people who understand and are, are individualized in their training, but again, we got the pandemic, so we got to figure out how we can support them in the pandemic. I have no idea how to do that. Hopefully the white paper has a, a few answers, but hopefully someone out, one of you participants will draw on this and write something spectacular that we can support to keep this work going because we want to keep on working on this issue. In my conversation with Director Jeff Davis, he said it's critical. He said he commends council that we, we're even trying to keep doing something. Everybody who has a stake in this should work on something, some area. And like I said, this paper is not the end all, be all. It's not the total answer. It's just a small piece of the puzzle and we realize that. But at least it's a step forward to keep working on the issue. Anybody, anybody else have a comment or a question they like to ask me? Or have I sufficiently, uh, again, just my information should be available to you on the website. So if you have any questions, just email me and I'll get back with you right away. And if you leave your phone number on there, I'll call you. And I'll explain, you know, sometimes people don't like to talk in front of other people. And that's cool. I understand that. You can call me directly, email me directly, and I'll answer any questions you may have so that you could write a, a very successful proposal um, that you'll get awarded. And I'll get a chance to work with you. I'm a very fun staff person. <laughs> no, nah, I'm taking it too far. But I, I'm very easy to work with. And you would enjoy working with me. Any other questions for my 14 participants? And my session ends at 510, but we don't have to stay on since I'm the last one of the day. Um, I don't want to hold people unless you want to be held. Um, uh, anything else? Um, one of the things, one of the things I will give you a, a clue. 
one of the things that the review panel is going to be looking for is that you develop some kind of advisory board or or a group uh, that 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 actually sits down and it has to be diverse and help you. Not one person should be sitting down by themselves. We want a diverse group of, of people with disabilities, uh, ethnicities, and 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 uh, DSP should be sitting down looking at it as well, as well as other professionals. They're going to be looking for that specifically. Because if you if you have that in your project and that's the group that's going to lead your work uh, from year to year, that's a good thing because you have somebody to springboard your ideals off of and to make sure it's all inclusive uh, to people uh, as you as you move forward. So um, just things to consider. Uh, where you can use various varied uh, communication methods and material. Uh, provide flexible access to resources, support, and events and spaces that anticipate and respond to needs. Listen to and recognize perspective of people with developmental disabilities and their families. That's a part of that group I'm talking about. And recognize how cultural and li li linguistic differences impact views on activities. This is things to remember as you develop your group or as you go through your project and begin to implement it if you get awarded the grant, you are going to run into people non-speaking or speaking different languages or, or from different cultures, cultures, and you want them to be able to be a part of your project or at least reap some of the benefits of the work that you're doing uh, as it relates to DSPs. So um, we're down to 13 people. So, and some of the, one of those is probably Paul, <laughs> who's ready to go, I know. Does anybody have any further questions for me? Again, like I said, you can email me directly. I will get back with you. I check my emails every day, all day long. And so if you have a question, I will get back with you and respond. If I don't know the answer, I will find the answer and still get back with you. I hope you, those of you who have been a part of this from the beginning of the day to the various sessions, I hope you've learned more about the DD Council and what it is we do. And uh, again, if you have any questions about the budget, you call Gary, DD Suites, you contact Paul. If you want to know more about clear language, you call Leslie Conley. If you want to know more about how do I deal with that session, that section on uh, un and underserved, you call Ken Latham or email him. All these people are valuable resources to you that will help you uh, get through your proposal. All right. So I thank you. Hey, Brenda. Michael Dinglinger, these are two people of council members. Michael Dinglinger is the chairperson of council and Brenda is a council member who sits on the community living committee. So I'm happy to have two council members uh, sitting in my session at the end of the day. And I want that you like the name Michael. Yes, I, I want to thank everyone who joined us today and, and listened to our great presentations from our wonderful staff. Hopefully they gave you some great information as I know they did um, for when you apply for when you apply for the grants. And as Patika said, they're all here for you for any questions that you have um, that may come up during your application process or anything that you may want to talk about with regard to that. They're here for you. And I want to thank our wonderful staff for your phenomenal presentations today. And I want everybody to have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. If anybody has any problem getting on our website, you need to contact Kim. Uh, and she, she's, she's our, our guru on that. And if she has to send you another link or point you in different, hey, I work for the DD Council and I asked her stuff all the time. I just asked her something the other day. So she's, she's available. She's good at getting back with you right away, assisting you with any resources you might need that's on council website. Just contact her and she will make sure you get whatever you need 
from my website or at least point you in the right deck direction on where you can find what you're looking for on our website. 